House of Healingites, thanks for transferring over here to the Deliverance Center. God bless you tonight. And welcome to uh, 119 degrees next week. Yeah, right <laughs> uh, miraculously, uh, people calling from out of state wanting to come visit us has dropped off right now. <laughs> it's much easier to get delivered during the winter. <laughs> All right. Good evening, and uh, welcome to the uh, services. YouTubers, God bless you tonight. Our YouTube family's growing like crazy. Have you seen that? Like oh, over a thousand a week now. Watch the teaching. So that's that's helpful. Okay, our uh, next uh, uh, seminar is the last Friday of the month. That'll be part four on the spirit world. Please remember that I'm on the radio every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. I'm also on uh, FM radio 96.1 out in the West Valley. If you happen to live out in Surprise in the Sun City in that area where I live, you can hear it on the radio in the mornings. Uh, all the radio programs are always available. YouTubers are on soundcloud.com slash hardcore-christianity. Remember our Thursday night teaching and healing service is broadcast on live stream and our Friday night services are broadcast on our YouTube channel. Okay, Thursday night it's live stream, Friday night it's it's our YouTube channel. <clears throat> Say, yeah, we need your help on the healing house next door. We closed on it, we now own it. And uh, yeah. yeah, we got a really good price on it. Uh, the guy that sold it to us was, was a crook and tried to get out of the deal, and uh, Rick saved it for us. And uh, it's zoned R3, so when we go to resell that to go to the National Deliverance Center, we're going to get a significant amount of money for it. So it's R3 zoning, which is unusual. Okay? But right now we're just going to use it for a Holy Ghost hotel for people coming in from out of state that don't have any money so they have a place to stay. Tonight's teaching will be on our YouTube channel, second one our House of Healing channel, and our donation boxes are on the doors, so when you go out the door, hey, can somebody uh, shut these, shut those doors out in the hallway there? Anybody? Yeah, just shut these doors here, so there's, yeah, thank you. And our donation boxes are on the doors, so that when you see them, you go out, you remember, hey, they need help. I need help. YouTubers, remember this? If you know somebody that needs to be healed or delivered and uh, you want to know what to do with them and how to do it, these two lists I'll send you at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. One's for mentally ill Christians, one's for troubled Christians. Okay? YouTubers, your job is to open up a terror cell in your church. That's one of our ministry goals. And you base it on this scripture right here, and that's how you structure it. And you start picking off the sick people in your church. See to it, they get healed. This building next door is now ours. It's part of our ministry. Uh, John is going to kind of coordinate the uh, renovation of it. I was over there the other day and cleaned it completely out because I didn't want anybody to see it. <laughs> because people thought I'd gone back to drinking. It looked like a crack house. <laughs> So I went over there. Oh, there's no pictures of it either, so there'll be no evidence. Um, but our dumpster out here is full, so I had to clean all that crap out of there. Because it was kind of embarrassing, to be honest with you. And I didn't want people to think that I was nuts. <laughs> Nobody ever thinks that. Never. 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 Hadn't happened in years. I'll see you tomorrow in Tucson. Would you call somebody in Tucson and tell them to meet me? At the Red Lion Inn, it's on North Oracle. We'll have our healing and deliverance service there. We go down there once a year during the summer. I'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock in Tucson. Okay? Let's start our Bible study. <clears throat> God created humans the best. He put us at the top. We're at the top of his creation. Humans. And at the top of humanity is what? 
you got organs in your body, you got all kinds of stuff going on, but the greatest, most miraculous thing about you as a person is your mind. People have been studying the brain for centuries. Neurologists, neuropsychologists, everybody, anybody and everybody, studying it for centuries, trying to figure it out, still can't do it. It's extremely miraculous and incredibly complicated. It inter interfaces with your brain. Your brain's kind of like the hard drive. Your mind is kind of like the software. And your mind has, believe it or not, a default mechanism. It has a default feature that is quite remarkable. Your mind is capable of clicking back to a pattern of thinking that's almost unconscious, particularly during periods of stress, pressure. It has a default mechanism where it clicks back to thinking a certain way or in a certain pattern, depending on certain type of environmental stimuli. That's what I want to talk to you about. Because <laughs> it's extremely important. The devil knows all about this default mechanism, and that's how he beats Christians. He whips them like pups. And this default process, or this pattern of thinking, starts out when you're right out the gate. And depending on what kind of environment you were raised in, it causes your brain, your mind, to think in a certain pattern. For example, if you're raised in this family here, you have a pattern of thinking that develops different from this family, for example. If you're raised in a family like that one, your brain develops an automatic thinking pattern that runs on its own, different from a family that's not raised like that. You know, the mind is, it's a miraculous thing. According to the neuropsychologists, we only use a small percentage of our brain. There's all kinds of theories about your mind and your brain. They can't prove it yet, but they think the brain and the mind is capable of like supernatural activities. I believe it because I've had periods in my, in my life where I was capable of what appeared to be su supernatural stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done that? Look back on your life and said, what was I thinking? Well, I've had several of those incidents. But a family that's raised like this one, see that sloth family? They have a pattern of thinking that's like, let's just chill. Stress comes into that sloth family. It's handled totally different than this vulture family. <laughs> They have a different kind of a thinking pattern as they're raised from little baby vultures. They learn to think in a different pattern. They process their environment totally differently. Correct? The, this family here, not going to get shook up by a lot of stuff. This family here, chronically shook. <laughs> And in the Bible, I thought I'd take a odd look at the disciples. I cherry-picked them. And I thought I'd look at the ones that aren't looked at too often. Who's this guy? Yes. This is guy. This is him. Didymus is the Greek word. And it means double. He was a twin. They don't know who the other twin was. There's several different theories on it, but I call him disappointed Didymus. 
I kind of call him Didymus the Downer. Some people call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas was raised in a family where the other twin got all the attention. It was probably a girl. She was probably a looker. Hot baby, funny, bright, personable. And Thomas kind of grew up in a family where a lot of bad things happened to him. And his thinking pattern, his mind pattern, his processing pattern, always went to him. Whatever happened always ended up disappointing. He would had a series of experiences when he was young, dozens of them, where he'd get his hopes up and then the thing would tank. And he learned over the years from childhood, he had this processing where in his mind, this is going to go bad. And he kind of developed a defense mechanism that Sigmund Freud discovered where the person keeps everybody at a distance and nobody gets too close in here because everybody he had let in previously ended up a disappointment. He didn't trust anybody growing up. The other twin got all the attention. She got the mine. He got the, the shaft. And to him, no matter what happened, it was, I know it's going to go bad. And the way his mind processed things, he developed a chronic negative attitude. Your attitude determines how you see something and how you view the world. True. This isn't deep psychology. You can show the same thing to two different people and get two totally different conclusions. This one could be a positive one. This one could be a negative one. Have you ever been around somebody who's chronically negative? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. They see stuff going bad that never crossed your mind. It's almost like they've got a sixth sense, the supernatural capacity to see disasters before they hit. They have an uncanny ability to create a disastrous environment. It's supernatural. Or it seems that way. No matter what you say, look, we're on the, we're on the two yard line. This is great. Oh, they'll fumble. <laughs> Dave, what? You ever met somebody like that? Some people are so negative they don't even play the lottery. <laughs> Others are so too smart to do that. There's no point in doing this because it'll just tank on me. I can't win anything. I remember when I was a kid, my mother said that to me one time. I never understood what she was talking about. She said, I don't know. I never win anything. And I kind of developed that. My, my started a process that way. And I told you this story a couple years ago. As I was in sixth grade, and I had, I had gone to our uh, game, what the name of it was. They were having a big fair or something over there, and one of the events was a cakewalk. You ever heard of a cakewalk? They only have them in the Midwest. But you put these numbers out on the floor, see, and then you play this music, and then everybody walks. No, that's, excuse me, that's, that's ring around. That's uh, the one where you sit down. This is the one where you stand on your ring, see, and somebody draws. Well, I was standing on whatever number it was. I can't remember. They pulled out the number, and since I had learned a process like my mother, I wasn't expecting to win. I knew I wasn't going to win. So they called out the number. I just stand there like nothing happened. Everybody else is looking at their number. I didn't even move. They said, hey, it's you. People started pointing at me like I was a serial killer. You, you. I go, me, what happened? I looked down. I couldn't believe it. It was a miracle. It was a Red Sea movement. I had won a cake. 
<laughs> and I was the first person in my family tree to ever win anything. <laughs> Why? Because everybody had that processing. See, you learn to process like you were raised. So I just assumed I couldn't win anything. I won that cake. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. I ran across the street. We lived right across the street from my grade school in Emporia, Kansas. And I ran over and gave the cake to my mom because I knew she'd never won anything. I said, Mom, look, see, cake. Let him eat cake. And we're winners now. <laughs> Don't you see, I had to adopt, you adopt how your pattern in your mind is from the idiots you're stuck with. Somebody's got to know what I'm talking about. And Doubting Thomas, a poor guy, he was raised in an environment where every time he got his hopes up, the thing would tank on him. And he was always getting hurt. So, your defense mechanism is, if I don't get my hopes up, I don't have a crash. I hadn't gotten my hopes up. Had the number six. I just assumed I wasn't six. So, if it was somebody else, I wasn't hurt. I wasn't disappointed I lost the cake because I wasn't expecting to win the cake. Why? Because I had my pattern, don't you see it? My mind had started down that road of chronic disappointments. That's how I was raised. That's why I like Thomas the best because I relate more to him than the other disciples. He had a constant, constant, subconscious concept that no matter what happens to me, I know it's going down. So I'm not going to let you into my life because I know you'll be a disappointment to me eventually, even though you look great now. I'm not going to get involved in that. Oh, no, that'll go under. That business will never work for me. Others it'll work for. But when I get involved in it, bankruptcy. John chapter 11. Jesus explains to them this story we went over last week. Raising of Lazarus. I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. I'm glad for your sakes I wasn't there. So you now may see and believe. Jesus says, Lazarus isn't dead. He's just sleeping. Good. If he's sleeping, he'll be better off. No. Boop. He's dead. Let's go. Back to they said, wait, wait a minute, Thomas said. Man, the last time you were in Judea, they tried to kill you. When you've got a pattern of thinking that is negative, you instantly see things others don't see. It's not we can do it, it's it's not gonna work. And Jesus says, I'm going anyway. So Thomas says, well, okay. All right. Let's just go die with him. <laughs> there he is. Thomas again. What was he really saying there? That's how I was raised. That's how my mind thinks. I think that way. Jesus told them, I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. I'm glad he's dead. So you will see this miracle, this resurrection, and you will believe. I go to raise him from the dead. Thomas doesn't hear anything, hear any of that. Why? When you have a chronic pattern of negative thinking in your mind, and you process that way by nature, so to speak, because you were raised that way, because everybody around you thought that way, because you absorbed their thinking patterns into your mind, you don't hear anything positive. Have you ever been around somebody who's negative all the time? 
They don't even hear when somebody says something good. They actually don't hear it. Their mind has already processed it out before it went into the consciousness. I go to raise Lazarus from the dead. Okay, let's come on, guys. Let's just go die with him. Just I might as well be over. Why? When you have a lifetime of negative thinking pattern that he learned from his family, death is a nice option for you. You're too much of a coward to do it yourself. But if it happens to you, it seems reasonable. Okay, let's just go die. Let's go. Can you imagine if Jesus had been raised with a neck? None of us would be sitting here. John 14. Jesus is revealing some of the greatest secrets in God's Word. The heart of the Bible is John 14, 15, and 16. You ever read those chapters? They're all written in red. He's explaining to the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And then he says, you know how to get there, because you know the way there. Uh-oh, shouldn't have said that to Thomas. <laughs> oh, here he goes. His childhood now comes back clicking, and he speaks right out. Hey, we don't know where you're going. If we don't know where you're going, how the heck can we find the way to go there? You see, somebody has a chronic negative thinking pattern. What he's saying seems reasonable. People who have chronic negative thinking patterns are not stupid. Many of them are very bright. It hasn't got anything to do with your IQ. It's your default mechanism in your brain. Positive, negative, positive, negative. It's a default pattern of thinking. And no matter what you say to them, he can be the most encouraging person in history, John 14. And you can say the greatest things a human's ever heard, John 14. You say something negative in return. Instead of doing cartwheels, Lord, that's great. That's the best thing I've ever heard. He goes, wait a minute. We don't know where you're going. How are we going to get there? We don't know how to get there. <coughs> Even during a celebration, a person with a negative thinking pattern from their childhood will automatically go negative. In the middle of a celebration, in the middle of a party, in the middle of the fair, in the middle of a cakewalk, they'll go negative. They see things like uh, figures. Uh, figures. You ever heard that term? That figures? Oh, yeah. That's saying a mountain about a person. That's a mountain of information in those two words. That's decades in those two words. That's a lifetime in those two words. It figures. They're telling you in an encyclopedia of information about themselves. They're like poor Thomas, raised to expect defeat even when caught in the jaws of victory. He always thinks it's going to go bad.
If I live to be 100, I'll never talk to someone or hear something from someone greater than what he heard. Never. He's standing there looking up at God's Son. And the information he's sharing is positive on steroids. It's positive to the 10th part. It's, it's so positive, it's ridiculous. He doesn't hear it as positive. He picks out the one thing that clicks in his mind. It's negative. He said, how can we, how can we, we don't, oops, edu, see. We don't see how to get there. What are you talking about? You ever heard it? Heard these people say it? Well, I'll believe that when I see it. Oh, listen, that they didn't call us. It figures. You don't have to be a, a counselor like me with 35 years of experience to catch that statement, do you? That's telling you a lot about that person. I'll see it when I believe. I'll believe it when I see it. That's telling you volumes about them. John chapter 20. Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus. That means double, twin. He wasn't with them when Jesus came. Oh, this was incredible. Boom, Jesus appears in the midst of all the disciples. Two of them are missing. One's dead. One of them doesn't see any point in coming to the prayer meetings anymore. Why don't you come to the prayer meeting? You know, I've been to those meetings before, and nothing's going to really happen. Well, wait a minute. Why don't you just, no, nah, I don't, not really. No, I've, been, I've done that before. Why don't you come down for prayer? And we'll pray? Now, listen, I've been prayed for five or six times. I, mean, I haven't been healed yet. I already know I'm not getting healed again. Well, let's pray again. Let's, you know what? I already prayed, and it figures. I'm talking about a normal Christian now. I'm not talking about an exceptional, odd, weird Christian. No, they're not odd or weird. They're normal. I don't need to go. Thomas said, I'm not going to go to the meeting. So he wasn't there when Jesus arrived. They're in a state of shock. They said, oh, they thought it was a demon. They thought it was a spook. He said, you got any fish around here? He said, where's the fish sandwich? Said, oh, we just came back from Long John Silver's. Here, try that. He said, here, give me that. Here, you ever seen a spook eat? Here, let me have you feel, feel that. These spooks don't feel like that. Then they're rejoicing. Then they were glad. Thomas wasn't there. Why? He was tired of it all. See, it figures he was crucified. It figures the Romans got him. I was there when they buried him. He was so beaten. I couldn't even recognize that figures. I had put all my fake hope in this man. And of course, he let me down. Of course, it was another disappointment. Is this making the real sense? Yes. Thomas was disappointed in God now. He didn't want to be with the other people. They still had hope. See, people who have chronic negative thinking patterns that they've inherited from their youth, they don't want to be around people that are hopeful. They don't like you. You get on their nerves. You piss them off. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. He wasn't there. Why was he? Why was he there? Was he had a paper route? No, his <laughs> chronic negative thinking has causing him now to see they had disappointed him God had disappointed him Christ disappointed him the Romans got him he's dead and he's now he's doing what he always does he, and then they they all do the same thing listen carefully once things go bad 
then they rehearse it in their minds and they say to themselves I knew that was gonna happen that's what I thought yeah and they've actually had prophetic words come in their mind of how it would fail I knew they wouldn't like him I knew he wasn't smart enough I knew she didn't care I knew they didn't really love me they actually process it back the disappointment hits here which they knew was coming then they process it back justifying it you have to justify your negative thinking pattern and then you always default back to that mentally Well, they went to him and said, hey, listen, hey, Thomas, we saw the Lord. He says, listen, you guys are a disappointment to me. Everybody is. My mom, my dad, my twin, they liked her better. Everything's a disappointment to me, okay? I'm not going to believe unless I stick my finger right up there where that Roman stabbed him. I'm going to stick my hand right in there. I'm not going to believe it. Jesus had told Thomas several times, listen there, the Romans are going to kill me, the Jews are going to butcher me, but I will be raised the third day. I told you in John 14, I'm going to go make a place for you. I want to come back and get you. Thomas heard all that. No, he didn't. Once you have developed a certain pattern of thinking, which is negative, you don't hear anything good anymore. You're expecting things to go bad. Why? Mom, dad, brother, sister, first husband, second husband, third wife, fourth wife, all of it went bad. And I knew it was going to happen before it happened. Unless I stick my fingers in there and see that and hold that, you can forget it. That's ridiculous. I'm out of here. I've had enough of these disappointments. The 10. I will not believe. It's a natural result of someone raised in an environment where your default mechanism is negative. That's normal for someone like that. You could sit here in the deliverance center right now and just go back gently in your mind. First grade, second grade, and listen to the people, your friends, who were your best friends. How did your parents handle adversity? How, what was their attitude in the home? And you can kind of hear you. You can hear you and the others. The devil knows what a default mechanism in your mind is. And he wants to train it a certain way. So that when he puts the heat on you here, your mind defaults there. He had Thomas beat. Eight days later, they finally convinced him. Say, hey, Thomas, please give us one more chance. Uh, I don't know what they said to him. They probably bribed him. We love you. We miss you. I don't know how they got him there, but he shows up. He gives it another shot. In almost everybody I've counseled over the years that has a chronic negative thought disorder, deep down inside, there's a glimmer of hope in there. There's a teeny glimmer of something in there. So Thomas, that little thing, kind of manifested, and he shows back up at the meeting. 
John chapter 20, there it is. Jesus came, he stands there, and he says what? What he always said every time he manifested himself after the resurrection, peace to you. That was the first thing he always said. Peace to you. Why? I went over that chart a couple of, or that slide, I think it was two weeks ago. It was remarkable. Do you remember that slide I put up about anger and angry? Nobody. All right, I'm doing a great job teaching. <laughs> I just had a default in my mind. It went back to me not being able to teach. I looked up anger and angry in the Old Testament. And do you remember that slide? It, it had been used almost 300 times. Well, the vast majority of times it had been used, it was Jehovah in the context of Jehovah being mad at humans. Does that ring any bells? Yes. 200, and, 200 and something times in the Old Testament, Jehovah was mad at us. Yes. Then I looked it up in the, in the four Gospels and Acts, and it only appeared four times. And in only one incident was God mad over people. He wasn't mad at them. It was the man with the withered hand. He looked around on the synagogue with anger. And then instantly, it said he went to sadness. Do you need any more proof that God's not mad at you anymore? You see, when Christ paid the penalty for your sin at the cross, all God's judgment and anger fell on him. And it missed you. So when you are here tonight, you have no excuse. Because God is not mad at you anymore. I find that hard to believe. I do too in the natural. Thinking of you, my own mind doesn't make a lick of sense. But when you think Hitler and Stalin's sins were bought and paid for at Calvary, God was not mad at them. Oh, that's blasphemy. So that, no, it's not. Look it up yourself. Since God's not mad at you anymore for anything you did or have ever done, there's peace between the two of you. Every time Jesus manifested after the resurrection, peace to you. Well, he does it again here. He says to the Thomas, peace to you. Then he comes after him to fix his default mechanism in his mind. What was he doing there? Notice the three things Thomas said. Notice all three of them are right there. What's that telling you? Jesus was listening to him when he said it, when he wasn't there. He had three things, Thomas said. If I don't get those three things, my default mechanism, click, negative, I will not believe. Jesus appears here and says, Thomas, peace to you. What were those three things? He mentions them. Here, stick your hand. Stick your hand in there. He never stuck his hand in there. He fell on the floor. Jesus said what? <laughs> Do not be an unbeliever. An apostos is an unbeliever. Don't be an unbeliever, be a believer. And the guy with the most negative pattern of thinking of all the disciples ends up giving us the most amazing statement in the New Testament. And then he throws us in on it. Yes. Yes. I've never seen Jesus Christ. Never seen him one time. Oh, you're not spiritual, Mike. I know a lot of people who have seen Jesus Christ quite often, and they ended up having familiar spirits. Okay. I don't have any need to see him. I got the Holy Ghost. This is a faith walk, not a sight walk. 
I'll be seeing like crazy after I kick the bucket. <laughs> Guess what happened to Thomas? He renewed his mind. There he is in the upper room with the rest of them. He didn't leave anymore. You know what had happened to him? He won the cake. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. This is the good news. Here's the bad news about these kind of people. It usually takes some kind of trauma to break that default mechanism. Very rarely do they ever talk themselves out of it. People try to do it all the time. They buy books and tapes and DVDs and CDs from prosperity and positive thinkers. They don't work. They work for the guy selling the DVDs. <laughs> but the sap buying it, that default mechanism from when you were two years old, that thing can't be overcome in the carnal world. It can be overcome in the spirit world. Thomas had broke that default mechanism. He always clicked back to some disappointment. Here, he's not thinking about his disappointments. He was told to wait and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until he be renewed with power from on high. That's right. He wasn't thinking default mechanism anymore. He was thinking about his future right. and God's incredible gifts and anointings. How did he do that? He had to be broken. Why am I saying that? Because God in his mercy is going to break some of you. Probably pretty soon, and you're going to remember this night and that text, and you're going to see it as a joy. Thank God I got broken. Were you raised like Thomas? Let's get after it tonight and fix it. Holy Ghost style. Didn't get any amens, but that's okay. That's a default. <laughs> Supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not. He preached in Persia. He died in Edessa and Mesopotamia. I don't know if any of that stuff's true. That's, that's not in the Bible. Hey, let's check out another interesting character. You ever heard of this dude? Few people have. He's one of the disciples, but he's one of the minor ones. His name means gift of God. He was born in Cana of Galilee. He was converted by brother Philip. Bartholomew is the same as him. That Nathaniel, Nathaniel is probably a surname. I don't know. And uh, supposedly he preached in Indian America. But this guy was really interesting. He wasn't like Thomas. He wasn't like me either. This guy had character. He was raised in a decent family. Thomas wasn't. He was raised in a dysfunctional family. A bunch of knuckleheads. Nathaniel wasn't. He was uh, somebody who had some character. He had, he would sit down and think about something reasonably. He was kind of the person that would ponder things. He wasn't given to rash decisions and quick responses and wild moves of his life. I'll move there, I'll move here, I'll marry them, I'll do... He wasn't like that. He would sit down and think about things. And ponder stuff, not do stupid things. He was a kind of a, a meditator, so to speak. Right? Philip found Nathaniel. He says, we found him who Moses talked about in the law. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel goes, I 
can anything good come out of Nazareth? He'd met several people from there, and most of them were dead bang losers. But he says, you know what? Okay. I'll give this a shot. Let me think about it. Yeah. And he says, uh, come, come and see. And he goes, you know what? Have you ever talked to somebody you can sit down and actually talk to and reason with? I didn't hear anything, so I know that I understand. There are very few of them out there. <laughs> but some people, once in a great while, maybe one in a million, you can sit down with somebody, particularly at work. Most of them are knuckleheads, but one guy at work, hey, let me talk to you about something. This happened and that happened, and this guy reacted, and then they did this, and they said, oh, okay, yeah, I see that. Yeah, well, what if we do this and that? Let's fix it. You ever met anybody like that? No, there's nobody in your family like that, but sometimes you'll meet them at work. <laughs> Nathaniel says, yeah, okay, I will come and see. Let, let, me, let me get on that. I will. I'll go take a look. And Jesus sees him coming. And Nathaniel was a person, unlike Thomas, who was a positive thinking person. He wasn't a chronic negative thinker. And he knew what the Bible said. He knew the Messiah was coming, and he knew he would be a special person, and he kind of had a kind of a sense of anticipation where Thomas would have the sense of, oh, this is going to be a disappointment. I know this is going to go bad. I know this isn't going to work. Nathaniel wasn't like that. He said, well, wait a minute. Let me, let me think about it. I'll give that a chance. Yeah, because I do know something's supposed to happen. You know, he had kind of more of a balance to his personality. His mind operated more balanced. He was a given a giver and a taker in his mind. He would process things differently that way. And Jesus sees him come and he says, hey, look at this. Dallas, there's no deceit in this person. This guy's a hardcore Israelite, follower of Jehovah. This guy's not a deceitful person. Well, how do you know that? Well, they had known it through the gift of knowledge, but Nathaniel says, well, how do you know me? And Jesus said what? I saw you. Edu, I saw you. I could see you sitting under that fig tree. I saw what you were doing like you normally do. I saw what you were doing. You were thinking about things. You were meditating on things. You were rationally looking at stuff. Pros, cons, how does this add up? Will that work? Well, maybe not. Maybe it will. If Jesus, the Bible does says he never saw Thomas, and who wants to see him? <laughs> who wants to be around somebody who's it's a continuous downer? See, those people wear you out emotionally. You don't even know it. You can hang around someone negative, and after a while you're pooped. And you don't even know. You're kind of like, I don't feel. Why don't I feel well? I felt fine a minute ago. <laughs> Nathaniel was, was a good person. You know, he'd been raised differently. His mind operated. His default mechanism wasn't like Thomas's. I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Oh my God, you're the, you're the Messiah. You're, you're, you're the one. Well, there's no way with that little evidence. I'm not saying that wasn't a great miracle, but that was nothing compared to the miracles in the Old Testament. Ten plagues of Egypt, the Red Sea, all the things Jehovah did. Those were off-the-hook miracles. He didn't need an off-the-hook miracle. He Just that one was good enough for him. Yeah. This guy's a preacher's dream. <laughs> This is my favorite person at the Deliverance Center. You just give them a little truth. They, really? Okay, I received that. Boom. Those people get healed in a minute. Boom. The other people sitting in church for 20 years, oh, God, I can't get healed. That's not going to happen. They don't even come down anymore for prayer. They don't come down anymore. I've had enough of that. Not Nathaniel, man. He just, any kind of truth at all, Jesus called them good soil. This, the word falls on four types of soil. One of them is good soil. One of them is somebody with no deceit, a dotless. 
Good ground. Tom, Thomas was not good ground. People with negative default patterns are not good ground. They're very hard to help. They don't receive truth. If they do receive it, they lose it quickly. Not Nathaniel, not the good grounders. Oh, they just absorb it. Oh, praise the Lord, let's go. You will see greater things than these. Then he asks uh, Nathaniel, and this is all you have to do to somebody who's good ground. You don't have to preach to them all day with constant positive things like you do Thomas's. They have to have constant positive prosperity pounded into their face. Not Nathaniel's. You give them one hopeful word and it carries them right on through. What if you see the Son of God with all the angels descending? And what if you see that? Boom, Nathaniel was in, lock, stock, and barrel. There aren't many hitting Nathaniels around, but when you find them, my God, they're a joy. They are some kind of a joy to have. I found one one time. I did. <clears throat> some guy came in to see me for counseling, and it wasn't going well. Thomas came in to see me. <laughs> but the demons had made a mistake. This guy, Thomas, had brought his wife. So while I'm in there praying for Thomas, his wife's out in the, sitting out in the sanctuary. So I'm getting kind of stumped, and I thought, well, I need another, I need to do something else here to help this guy. A thought popped in my head, go grab the wife. I bolt out the prayer room, I run down here. Are you uh, Downing Thomas's wife? <laughs> yes, I am. I grab her arm and drag her into the prayer room. That's not a normal technique that you use to minister to people, drag them somewhere. <laughs> but there are times, there are occasions for an anointed drag. <laughs> I said to this wife in front of him, I wanted to do it in front of him. So I was trying to get him, I'm trying, I'm working on him. I'm using her to help him. I said to her, uh, you ever smoke in tongues? No, I haven't. Oh, well, you can, you can speak in tongues now. Boom, I grabbed her head. First I dragged, drug her in. It's called caveman ministries. <laughs> what you do is you drag the person around, then you grab their heads. See, but you don't do that with every person. Okay, otherwise you're going to hear from a personal injury lawyer. She starts speaking in tongues right there, just like that. See, praise the Lord. I'm looking at him the whole time. I'm trying to get him to release it. That woman was a Nathaniel. She's in that room right there. She's right in there right now, looking at me. I hope that God, her husband, isn't watching. <laughs> this one may not be on YouTube. Now I think about it. Don't you see, Nathaniels are easy to win to Christ. They're easy to see healed. Easy to see delivered. Oh, they grow rapidly spiritually. They get rid of all their crummy family and friends that drag them down spiritually. They know how to cut people out of their lives. They don't do it viciously. They gently just cut the tow line and the boats just swift off. Jesus called them what? Good ground. Guess what happened to him? There he is. Acts chapter 1. Upper room, there he is. He made it the whole way. He didn't have to be broken. Don't you see it? The people that have the default thinking patterns that are negative have to be broken. 
addicts have to be broken. They never recover. Porn addicts break. Yes. Some people have to be broken. The Nathaniels don't need to be broken. All right, let's try another one. You enjoying these psychiatric autopsies? <laughs> James, his famous brother, John. Okay, we're not doing John. Everybody does him. Let's go to do James. Who was he? Well, here's some information about him. He's John's brother, right? He's the son of Zebedee and Salome, right? His dad, Zebedee, any of you grow up with a dad like that? Driven, hardworking, workaholic, yes. smart, successful, usually self-employed, management style, success-oriented person, driven, started his own fishing business, hardworking, workaholic, Family man, but an absent family man. Hello? Not around much. Not heavy on the huggies and the kissies. Steady as they go. Paying the bills. No divorces. No drugs. No whores. Level-headed person. Hard-working. Good provider. Poor lover. Not good on the lovies and kissies, very good on the paying the bills, providing, taking care of you. Zebedee, hardcore, tough guy. Fishing was a tough business, hard business, long hours, hard work, successful man. Built up a great business, took his two sons. His two sons into the business. James, the older one. John, the younger one. They got into the business. They grew up like dad. When they were little, they were mama's boys. Mommy took care of them. Mommy was also a successful person. Successful homemaker. Did a great job raising the kids. We don't know how many sisters they had. They were like their dad. Strong, hard workers, productive, ambitious. ambitious. Thank you. Just like their dad. Dad's thinking pattern had clicked into them. They thought like him. They were successful like him. Mark chapter 4, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4. Going on from there, Jesus saw two brothers, James and the son of Zebedee and John, in a ship, and they were mending their nets. Of course, they're working all the time. They had a successful fishing business, probably had a bunch of employees. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their ship, and they left their father, and they followed Christ. That's amazing. That is remarkable. You ever think about that verse? I could spend a, an hour just on that verse. Let's skip that family dynamic. At the same time came the disciples to Jesus. This is chapter 18. And there was a uh, conference going on between the 12 of them. What was it? A church board meeting. All churches have these same board meetings. All churches have these exact same problems. Every church. Am I above you? How can I get above that one? Am I in charge of that? Are these people under me? People are always looking for their little world of authority. And it says, hey, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus stunned them that day and brought in a little child. He said, this type of a person here is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. James and John couldn't believe it. They never received it. They said, that's ridiculous. 
That's absurd. You can't build a successful fishing business with a kid. You can't be successful like a little kid. That's stupid. Jesus wasn't talking about fishing business. He was talking about the Holy Ghost and the spirit world. Seven years ago, I told you that story about that time I was in that service with Catherine Kuhlman. It's on YouTube. It's had thousands of views. A lot of weird comments. Oh, and I went and seen her when I was a teenager. I was like James and John. I thought I had it going. I was getting A's, straight A's in college. I was full of myself. 19 years old. I know everything. Now teenagers know everything. If you don't believe it, ask them. <laughs> I went through that whole story how I'd been there for, you know, I'd put in at least eight or nine hours before she came out on the stage. Drive time, wait time. Watch that video. It's kind of funny. If you've ever seen anybody laugh and cry their way through a story, that was me on that video, laughing and crying my way through it. Well, she comes out after I'd been there nine hours, and I couldn't wait to see her because there were 16,000 people in the auditorium. She comes out, and, and it's stone quiet in the auditorium. We were at the Maybe Center at ORU. The basketball auditorium. The whole thing was full. Plus the f ground was full. full. It sat 14 and then there was 2,000. There was 16,000 people there. There wasn't one seat left. I couldn't believe it. I said, well, I said who in God's name is coming out here? God? Why would 16,000 people come to see a female preacher from Pittsburgh? That doesn't make any sense. Stupidest thing I ever heard. I'm not going to go see a female preacher from Pittsburgh. I wouldn't walk across the street in Emporia. I'm not going to drive four hours. Then she comes out on the stage there, and she's wearing a nightgown. <laughs> and she's got long red hair and as homely as a mud fence. I mean, I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, you mean to tell me 16,000 people I'm number 16,000. Came to see that? You gots to be kidding. Then she walks up to the microphone. Stone silent everywhere. Whole auditorium. Pin dropping. She says, look, she looks up. She looks up there. Like she's talking to somebody. And then she goes, Dear Jesus. Nightgown flopping. <laughs> I don't have a thing tonight. I just put in nine hours. I came from three states away. And you don't have a thing tonight? Something wrong here. I'm back in Bangkok. This is something wrong. I didn't know then because I was spiritually ignorant and full of myself, which is the worst condition you could ever be in. Yes. You couldn't get in the worst spot and I was in. Full of myself and ignorant spiritually. That's, that's two steps from damnation. I didn't know at the time that she was in this verse here. She was that little child that went out there an open loving heart that God can trust. Well, you hear about the miracles if you watch that video, but I didn't know then, but I know it now. The best spot to be in in life is when you don't have a thing. That's when the Holy Ghost says, I'll do the rest. And he took over in that service. My mind was blown. I never saw anything like it. To this day, I've never seen anything like it. What was he saying? I mean, hey, listen, James and John, hardcore, successful, pushers, dominant, strong. Hey, listen to this. 
you're not going to make it. Here's what you got to make. Give me that kid. Look at this kid. Look at Catherine Kuhlman. There she is. You're like Brother Mike. You're the idiot. Here's the kid that's going to make it. You're not. Unless you be converted, strafo means to U-turn, twist around. Converted means to Unless you be converted, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They were fighting over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They weren't even going in. <laughs> and the only way in was if they learned to say, Dear Jesus, I don't have a thing tonight. What was he doing? Jesus was the master psychiatrist. He was taking their personalities, knowing they came from Zebedee and what kind of a man he was. He knew they were like him in similarity. They had to be brought down. Nathaniel had to be built up. Thomas had to be the Holy Ghost takes each individual person as if there were not another person on the planet and he ministers to them individually and distinctly he never works with groups all he sees is the individual in the group if you humble yourself like a little child you will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven I saw that that day in that service. I saw it with my eyes. It was incredible, to say the least. Matthew 20, then came to Jesus, the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons. See? Here's how you do it. When you're a mama's boy and daddy's not around, daddy was still fishing. He was kicking butt. Mama went with the boys. She's leading them to Jesus. They're following her. Yeah. If you've seen the hens, they lead the chicks. The chicks aren't running out in front. They're, you've seen the ducks? The, the geese, they're following behind. True? Yes. <laughs> James and John are the chicks. They're following Big Mama in. <laughs> Lord, I want to ask you something. Before she asks him, she does the right thing. She comes in worshiping. Oh, try that, friend. You'll get your answers to prayer will click double like within hours, days. Come in worshiping first. He says, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? He says, I want you to grant my two sons. <laughs> this was after they had already gone over the child thing. <laughs> oh, you're not getting it. They had already been told about the child. It went in this ear, then went out that ear. James, John. <laughs> They didn't hear a word he said. Now they want to know the heck with this getting into the kingdom. See? Always remember, Satan's greatest sin was his pride. And once you let pride go, release it in your soul, it always climbs. It never just stays there. See, before they were fighting who was going to get into the kingdom of heaven, now they want to be in the kingdom of heaven and the boss of the kingdom of heaven. 
They want to sit right there. He already told them they weren't getting in. Didn't hear it. You ever talk to somebody who's arrogant? You can't get a cotton-picking thing through that person's brain. Not a bit. They'll start criticizing you. I've had it happen. I've had people call me on the phone. Brother Mike, I'm so, I got this, I need that, I need that. Can I come in and see you? Yeah, here, I'll put you on the schedule. Come on in and see me. They come in and see me. Then they start telling me what they need. <laughs> Didn't you call me? Aren't you here because you've got some things you need fixed? You're telling me how to fix it? <laughs> wow. James and John, man. No. Sons of Thunder was their name. <laughs> Powerful, like dad. Strong. Mother, very supportive. Here, sons, I'll get it for you. Lord, would you, would you mind if my two sons, I know they're not getting in the kingdom. I remember the story about the kid, but I love them so much I got to ask, can they sit to your right hand and left hand in glory? <laughs> Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking me. Are you able to take the baptism I'm baptized with? Are you, are you able to drink the cup? Yeah, we're able. Now they're up there. See? Mom got the door open. Then James and John, they come forward. Now they're talking to him. We're able to do that, of course. No problem. That's what my dad taught me. Push your way through it. Work hard. Dedicate yourself. Push it. I was raised like that. Of course I can do it. Jesus said, you know what? You're right. You will be baptized with the Holy Ghost like me. You will die a martyr like me. But, he says, what? Well, I don't have the ability to give that to you. That's not in my, it's not in my pay grade. Father makes those determinations and makes that decision. James and John muffle off. Jesus goes, Phew. thank God I didn't have anything to do with that. Have you ever been glad you didn't have something to do with something? <laughs> yeah. Anybody here married? Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's come in handy over the years. What happened to this and that, and how come that went this way? Oh, the joy of your life hits you when you don't actually know. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. I didn't talk to them. Remember those days, guys? Come on, guys. Yeah. Give me a fact. Yeah. Oh, a bunch of divorced guys here. Okay. Here we go. You're asking me something I can't give you. But the fact that they would ask it tells you volumes about their personalities and how they were raised. Doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe. Luke 9. It came to pass when the time was come that Jesus should be received up. Okay. What was the purpose of Christ's earthly life? To save our souls. The evangelistic ministry was a prelude to it. And it came to an end. He entered his ministry at the baptism of John the Baptist, and he ended it here, correct? Yes. Now it's time to end it. He's already taught them all these things. And he says, we've got to go to Jerusalem. He'd already told them several times, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'll be murdered. The Jews and Romans are going to kill me. I'll be raised the third day. He told them that on several occasions. In that ear, out that ear. So he sends messengers in before he gets to Jerusalem, and he does something remarkable. He wants to stay in a village of the Samaritans. Wow, bad news. They told him to get lost. Why is that? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 17, we see the history of these guys. These were Jews that intermingled with pagans. 
and they developed a off-brand of Judaism, you know? Like you got Christianity and you mingle it with Joseph Smith, you come up with Mormonism. I can't be too hard on the Mormons, they sold us this building. <laughs> I can't be too hard on them anymore, but I am hard on the Jehovah Witnesses. I'll jump there. Uh, I've had enough of them. Okay, back to this. They were a mix. See, you get Christianity and you mix something else in it, you come up with Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, and Christadelphianism, Christian science, all these cults. Correct? And they had built a temple on Gerizim, on the mountain there, in 331 B.C., and that's in the book of Josephus. I'm just putting that up here for our YouTube listeners. Well, anyway... When they went to rebuild the temple here in Ezra, they said, hey, we're not going to allow you guys to help us build the temple because you're contaminated. You're unclean. So from that moment on, Hatfields, McCoys. That, that was the split. They never got back together. They hated each other. Jews hated half-breed Samaritan Jews. That's how the rift started. Well, no, no self-respecting rabbi would have had anything to do with a Samaritan. That was, that was a sin. That was unbelievable. The fact that Jesus went to the woman at the well, told you how the law was going to end and grace was going to replace it. Amen. Now, God is not mad at you anymore. All right. They had the Pentateuch, that was their main book, but they also mixed it in with paganism, just like we do today. Holy Bible, Book of Mormon, click, cult. Holy Bible, New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness, change the word, mix it, cult. Same thing there, they did the same thing. Take the Pentateuch, they mixed in paganism, cult. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. All right. Now, about that time, Acts chapter 12, Herod the king stretched, stretched forth his hand to start persecuting the Christians, and guess what happened? Disciples James and John saw this, and they said, Lord, what will that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume? Oops, that's, sorry, that's not supposed to be there. Here it is, Luke 9. The Samaritans tell Jesus to get lost. Guess what happens? If you gave Zebedee any lip, you were fired. You got thrown off the dock. He wouldn't mess around with you. You screw up, you're out the door. Well, suddenly Zebedee's standing there in the form of his two sons. They had the same default mechanism in their mind. No tolerance for failure. No tolerance for weakness. Tough. Tough it out. He said, Lord, listen. You want us to call down fire from heaven and fry these losers? <laughs> That's what Zebedee would have said. Because they rejected him. It was an insult. They insulted him. Well, Zebedee didn't put up with that. He taught the boys to fight. Fight back. You know, don't start a fight, but finish it, he would tell them. You don't go around starting fights, but if somebody comes to you, you finish it, son. You kick their butts. And that's what they were doing. They were about ready to, they wanted to cook everybody. You know who did that years later to the Jews? Hitler. He cooked them. Just like they were going to cook the Samaritans. They were cremated. He wanted to cremate them. Like Hitler. And remember, this was John who later became the apostle of Hitler. 
He went from cremating people to saving them. Now here is one of the most interesting verses I ever read several years ago. This one really lit my ministry that I'm in now. It was in the very beginnings of it. This was quite revealing to me. Luke chapter 9, verse 55. Check this out. They wanted God to mass murder these people. They want judgment. Boom, cook them. Because he said, like Elijah did, the fire came down from heaven and burned up the offering, burnt up the altar. Then it says it burned up the dust in the ditch and burned up all the water in the ditch. Why was that? Well, back then the pagans would set up these elaborate night fires and they would have people hidden under these structures feeding these fires. It was, all, it was their version of uh, psychic readers or a psychic hotline. Most of them people are phony. Some of them have that psychic power, but the vast majority of them are just fakes. Well, Jehovah said, I'll prove to you this isn't a fake. I'm going to burn the whole thing up and burned up the dust that it's all sitting on. Cooked it. They said, let's cook the Samaritans like he cooked them. Which was worse than, worse than Hitler. Hitler had ashes after the cremation that had to be removed. We have ashes if you get cremated. Now, what do you keep them in? An urn. An urn. Yeah, you put the ashes in the urn. When Jehovah burns something up, there's no ashes left. Now well, that should have landed. Check this out. Now let's look at this verse and be more careful as we read it. This Greek word, epitomao, is only used by Jesus to rebuke demons. And he says, Jesus turns to them when they said that. Have you ever done that with a relative or a friend? They say something so stupid you can't believe it. You just, like, go. Your eyes are like bugging. Jesus' eyes will. What do you. You mean to tell me I just finished a two-hour teaching on God's grace and love and you just said that? It causes your face to... What's it? You get that married look on your face? Oh God. What? Jaw going. Jesus had all them looks. You either don't see what Hoyas sort of spirit... You belong to a stay. I'll sit down while I finish that thought. I was struggling with Christians having spirits. This was years ago. And I had all these people coming to me at the Assembly of God Church for deliverance. And they were all, the vast majority of them were good people. They were good Christians. And they had nice ministries, some of them. And it was causing a confusion in my mind. I didn't understand it really. How does that work? Then it got more confusing. Some of these Christians who were good people came back to me later to go through deliverance again because they had gotten reinfected. That was causing me confusion and pain until I saw this verse. I guess it's only me then. No. If you're... <laughs> I am not the son of God, far from it. Trust me, you can ask my wife. <laughs> if Jesus had problems with disciples with spirits, then I'm going to chill my way through it. Yes. It happened to Peter. 
you're not going to go there. You're not going to die for You're not going to Jerusalem. Get thee behind me. The disciples had spirits. And they were standing two feet from God. Now, what lesson did I learn from that? That's an interesting concept. How does that work? Let me think about it. Mm, free will determines God's power. And I quickly reread the New Testament two more times, and sure enough, free will trumped God's power numerous times. Human free will, check this out, trumps God's will numerous times. That's blasphemy. No, it was called reading. I read the text and saw it as clear as a bell. Your free will keeps you from all the blessings and benefits Father wants to give you. It's God's will for you to have all this. But you don't have it. Why? Human free will trumps it all. You can't even get saved without human free will. You have to willfully, of your own free will, reject Buddha, Allah, Confucius, Gandhi, and receive Christ. It's a choice of your free will. You living in sin is a choice in the beginning of your free will. That was a great revelation to me. It cleared up a lot of confusion. How could Peter be this great disciple and then say something like that? And it all made sense to me. He had a default mechanism in his mind. He hadn't renewed his mind. Thomas had not renewed his mind. James and John had not re renewed theirs. The son of, not, son of man did not come to destroy men's souls, but to sozo deliver them, he said. What's that mean? God is not mad at you anymore. Guess what happened to him? He made it. He finally renewed his mind, and then what happened to him? You will indeed do what? Yeah, you're going to drink my cup, just like you said. Herod killed him. Let's close with Philip, my favorite one. You ever met anybody named Philip? Yeah, let's do a, a psychiatric autopsy on him. <laughs> he was an intellectual. He wasn't like Nathaniel. Have you ever noticed sometimes one child grows up in the same family with the same parents, totally different And in some cases, the child doesn't even look like their parents. Yeah. It's, later on, sometimes it's revealed that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but back to the other point, sometimes in the same family, two kids knowing they're in the same family, don't, they're not, they're like, you're, like you're going, well, they don't even seem like, that's, that person doesn't seem like they're in the same family. They don't even look like, they don't even think like, well, that, now we're there. Philip had a high IQ. He was smarter than Nathaniel. He was brilliant. Don't raise your hands, but some people here tonight have high IQs. Your IQ, as I mentioned before, is something you inherit. 
You can't change it like your skin color. I am a Gosh, look at my skin. It's old and crusty, but it's white. <laughs> I can't change it. I was born with it. Well, your IQ is also given to you at birth. Okay? Your mind is in your brain. Your brain was inherited. Okay? Now you can improve how your mind works. You can improve things like memory and so on by different techniques, training your mind to do certain things, but you can't increase your IQ. Now on cable, they run ads saying you can. You take these pills, you can go from, you know, shoveling dirt to building rockets. That's all lies. You can't do that. Your IQ you were born with, and if you were born dumb, God love you. That's it. You're done. You're going to die dumb. If you were born really smart, hey, that's you. There you are. You know, don't raise your hands. That's how you die. If you were born white, I wasn't born crusty white. I mean, at one time I had skin that didn't look like <laughs> leprosy. But this woman here, skin is black. See her? She's black, I'm white. She can't change her skin color. I can't either. She has an IQ that's at a certain level. Statistically, what's average? 100. 100 is your average IQ statistically. And if you're 100, you're going to die about 100. <laughs> that's it. Now, how intelligent you are is very, very important to how you live your life. Okay? People that are dumb don't typically do well academically. They don't typically do well in thinking professions. People that uh, are really smart I uh, be usually get bored easy over mundane activities or they want things that are stimulating mentally you know computers a textbook example you're really intelligent children are really good at uh, computer work and you know I, I try it and you know I'm, I'm struggling through the thing and uh, what a 13 year old 13 year old kid hacked the CIA and got their emails, remember that? Some 13-year-old kid, you either have it or you don't. Correct? Philip had it. He was a thinker. He was a collator. He would think about things deeply. See? He was an analyzer, analyzing things. It's the way he grew up. John chapter 1, Jesus went to Galilee, found Philip, and he said, follow me. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, and the city of Andrew and Peter and Philip found Nathanael and said, We have found him whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, Philip met Christ and, like you would think, got all the information from me. Where are you from? What do you believe? He interrogated him. And, click, in his mind, this is the guy. Who's your dad? Joseph. What's his lineage? Oh, okay. Who's your mother? What's her lineage? Oh, and you know, he's thinking. He interviewed him. Yashua, right? What's that name mean? Oh, where were you born? Oh, okay. That cl he's clicking. Things are clicking with him. Dumb people don't know the answers, they don't even know the questions to ask. <laughs> Philip, high IQ, 130, 140, whatever it was, 
He's interrogating Christ. Click, 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 click. It's all adding up. <laughs> Bang! You're the Messiah. He figured it out. So he goes and tells his brother, hey, we found him, and here's the data. And then Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip naturally is collating again, says, <clears throat> well, listen, the proof of the pudding's in the tasting. Come and see it. Check it out for yourself. And he outsmarts Nathaniel and convinces him, well, that was a good, yeah, you got me there. That's a good advice. I will come and see. John chapter 6. Jesus lifts up his eyes after a great day of teaching and he sees a gigantic mob of people coming at him on the plain. Remember this story? And Philip said, he says to Philip, listen, where are we going to buy bread? Why is he saying that to Philip? Philip was the brains of the outfit. Peter was the big mouth of the outfit. Ah. Philip was the thinker. Judas carried the bag. He was the greed-ridden one. He liked himself. Narcissism. What's in it for me? Philip was the thinker. Everybody knew he was the smart one, including Jesus. So he says to Philip, the thinker, Philip, here's look at all these people, thousands of them. Where are we going to go to buy bread to feed these people? What's he doing there? What's he doing there? Smart people are hard to convert to Christ, and they're hard to see healed and delivered, and they're hard people to see get miracles. They analyze everything. And sometimes the only way to get through to an intelligent person is to have a more important person ask them questions and lead them where they don't want to go. <laughs> Christ, whose IQ was significantly higher than Philip's, and Philip was, was a brilliant, Jesus got to lead him with his mind where he doesn't want to go naturally. His thinking pattern defaults to chronic analytics. And these people are a pain in the spiritually. They drive you nuts. Why? They, have, they don't have childlike faith. They become what? Bible scholars. <laughs> A Bible scholar is the last person you need when you're desperate for a miracle from God. If you want to know what book this is in and what, how that compares to another book, go find you a Bible scholar. They're great. You need a miracle from God. The last person you want to see is a Bible scholar. What you really want to see is some woman wearing a nightgown walk out on the stage there. Jesus, you know, I don't have a thing tonight. That is the person you want to see, not somebody with a high IQ. <laughs> Jesus has now got to intellectually lead the intellectual where he doesn't want to go. Philip! He didn't say that to Peter. Peter would have been talking a mile a minute, making no sense at all. <laughs> See, he goes to the brains of the outfit. Peter was dumb compared to Philip. That's why he talks all the time. Yeah. See, dumb people... Who have, who have extrovert personalities. They grew up with dad who was a laugher and a joker. They try to talk their intelligence into you and make you think they're smart. <laughs> no, he didn't ask Peter. Jesus knew he'd get a five-minute diatribe on Peter. He's not in the mood for it. He went to Philip, the thinker. He said, Philip, where are we going to feed 5,000 men? Another f where are all the what are we going to do about it? Where are we going to go buy? Think about it, Philip. Philip, think. <laughs> <laughs> but
But Jesus said this to do what? Dumb people can't be intellectually tested. They need to be whipped. They call them mules. Secretariat, you didn't whip. That horse had a doctor's degree. Smart as a whip. A mule, they got to be whipped to get out of the barn. Secretariat, he's testing him. What are we going to do? How are we going to feed him? Where are we going to buy the food at? And Philip doesn't get it. He defaults to analytics. And he's actually thinking, well, wait a minute here. A denarian of bread is not sufficient for these thousands of people. He says, even if we get 200 penny, 200 denarian, a denarian was a, like a quarter. Even when we pulled all of our money and then took the money Judas has stolen, if we loaded it all there, we couldn't even get a bite out of each. Can you believe it? He's thinking this out. Do you understand that? These people are the worst people to have in your ministry if you're a miracle Holy Ghost oriented ministry. He's processing his mind automatically. Thomas, disappointment. Philip, analytics. It's second nature to him. It's how he was raised. He said, we can't even get one of them to take a bite. And one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, hey, hey, can I chip in on this conversation too? Dumb people listening to smart people get jealous, so they want to chip in. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? You ever been around dumb people that want to be smart, and somebody's saying something that's and tell they know they're smart, so they they feel kind of bad about it. So you know, I I'm kind of an idiot, and I know I am, and I was raised among idiots. My dad's an idiot too, and I don't want to be an idiot anymore. Can I chip in on this conversation? Hey, there's a lad here with a sack lunch. He just blurts it out. <laughs> Oh, that helped. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's killing it. Oh, kid here with a sack lunch. Yeah, 2,000 sitting here, 3,000 over there. Yeah, I got a kid with a sack lunch. Can I ship you in? Because I'm an idiot, but I don't want to be an idiot anymore. Everybody thinks I'm an idiot. Do you think I'm an idiot? I'm not. There's a kid with a sack lunch. <laughs> it's, it's the deep-seated insecurity that makes you say stupid stuff. <laughs> and don't point at anybody. <laughs> Hey, look at this. We got five. I even counted them. Look, Lord, I'm on. Oh, that's good, Andrew. Yeah, you're doing good on your, your math class. There's five, there's five loaves of bread here. Five fishes there. But you know, now that I think about it, what are those among so many? Dumb people just want to be a part of it. They don't have a solution. <laughs> I got to be opening somebody's eyes right now. This can't go to waste. And then look at this. Well, you now I think about it. I don't. This isn't going to work. Is it? But I, I really, I really wasn't analyzing it. Uh, I just wanted to be a part of this so I don't seem like such an idiot the way my mom used to look at me. Oh, if we got two hundred of these. We can't even get them a nibble. Oh, there it is. I got a basket here. Good job, Andrew. <laughs> Matthew 26. Philip's at it again, man. When the disciples saw this woman with the alabaster box, this may be the greatest story in all the Bible, this whore that comes down in Simon's house. You remember that story? It, it's too good to be true. He sees this happen. She breaks the alabaster box. Some people have to be broken. The disciples saw it and they said, including Philip, he's thinking again. He's thinking. And he's 
rational. It's not that he thinks stupid things. He has a default mechanism in his mind to analytics. My God, she broke that. They all knew what it was. And we don't want to know why they knew. They saw this muron, is what it was, and it was extremely expensive, imported from India. It cost a fortune. Whores had it for their upper crust clients. The regular guy on the street didn't get the stuff, good stuff. I say, hey, what? What? Why is this going to waste? We should have, we should have sold it. We should have taken it from her and sold it and help the poor. Well, the poor you have with you always, but very rarely do you see somebody break their alabaster box to get saved and healed. That doesn't happen very often. You always have the poor with you. That's right. They don't get saved. They don't come to me. But look at this woman. Broken. What's he doing there? Just what Philip does. He was dollar and cents in it. He was bottom lining it. How about you? Do you got a default mechanism in your mind that no matter what happens, something good, somebody says something good, something good finally happens to you? Maybe they did finally call your number on the cakewalk like they'd done me that day, but your mind defaults back automatically to negativity, self-centeredness, How about these? Are, is this your default mechanism? Is that how you think and you don't even know you're thinking it? It just suddenly clicks. And critical, negative, critical about yourself or others, negative about yourself or others. Negative about your future. It just automatically clicks like that. Do you know you have that? What was I trying to do tonight? I was trying to get you to think about yourself. I was trying to get you to see that you're not alone. That even people who saw Jesus Christ there have the same problems we do. What was I doing tonight? I was trying to help you see there's hope for you. What was I doing tonight? I was trying to get you to see that, you know what? Not everybody has to be broken. Some people can see it and repent and break themselves. The only way you can figure this out is if you slow yourself down and analyze how you think. I'm going to let you in on a secret. The people that live around you, they already know. <laughs> yep. They already know how you think. They've told you. You ignored them. Uh -huh. You won't hear it. Talk to the hand. You've heard that before. You've already heard these words before. Why do you always... Well, there you go again. Di you had no idea at the moment that happened that the Holy Ghost was letting that happen to try to get through to you. That you have a default mechanism in your mind that is going to cost you your future.
you thought that was your insane spouse or another crazy relative or the idiot at work saying those things about you and you missed it. It was God allowing it to happen. Why do you always think about yourself? You. Oh, oh, she just nags. That's her problem. Oh, the boss, the boss, he's, 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 he's anal retentive. No, that's your defense mechanism kicking in to blame somebody else for your problems. God even allows your kids to tell you, oh, that hurts. But it happens all the time, even subtly. Remember when you were a kid, you came home, Mike, Mike, shh, Dad's sleeping. Shh, quiet. Don't slam the toilet seat lid. Mike, don't slam the lid. What was she really saying? What was she really saying when she told me to shush? Your dad's sleeping. What was she really saying? I know your dad. And if you wake him up, there will be trouble. <laughs> Listen. Don't tell your mom. Don't tell her. What was he really saying to you? A lot more than don't tell her. Yeah. Now there was a reason he didn't want you to tell her. Child abusers do that all the time. If you tell, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Why? They don't tell you this. If I get caught, I get to go to prison. <laughs> he didn't tell you that. God allows family members you don't like to do it. <sighs> Does that ever hurt? You know, it hurts worse than that. God allows family members you don't respect to tell you. No. Yeah. You hear that? <laughs> Some gal fainted back there. <laughs> Fell right out of her chair. You talk about pain. Somebody tells you something wrong with you and they're right. And it's somebody you don't respect. Dear God, why was I ever born? That's how bad it is. What's going on there? Well, since you won't come to the Lord and pray it out, and since you won't take an objective look at yourself, God has no other choice but to use the knuckleheads and the bimbos in your life. <laughs> what choice does he have? He's not going to send Michael the archangel down to you. You know something? You, hey, whew, Michael, how you doing there, buddy? Listen, you're, you're doing this and that and this and that wrong. Okay, this is, it doesn't work like that. It does in our it does in our, our church? You're not in your church here. This is this is a real gathering here. We're we're not in that angel stuff church. They come here for deliverance. <laughs> You're not getting an angel to come to tell you, hey, you know, you're a little harsh with your kids. You know, you got a you got a default mechanism in your mind. You're always thinking something negative. Have you ever noticed you say things negative more than you say that they're positive? Yeah, Gabriel's not coming down for you, son. <laughs> so since you won't come to God over it, and since he loves you and is not mad at you anymore, he's got to let these people in your life keep telling you that. This is your default. What was I doing tonight? I was trying to get you to 
you know, take a look at yourself. And what was I trying to do? Get you to answer this question. Turn down the lights there if you would. I was trying to get you to answer this question from God. Here's what God said to you. How much longer are you going to continue to live without renewing your mind? How many more years are you going to waste in this condition? How many more? How much longer? Because each person here, including me, has a clock ticking. And the clock's ticking on you. And every person here, including me, has very little time left. Oh, that's not true. Life expectancy went up. <laughs> it went up from what, 71 to 82? Oh, that's huge. Yeah. You see, it's not how long you live that matters. It's the quality of your life. Correct. Okay? If you live to be 120, like that lady in Outer Mongolia or wherever she was, it's not the age. It's how healthy are you? How alert are you? What kind of quality of life do you have? If you live 60 solid years, that's better than living to 120 if you can't function or you can't get around or you're not in good health. Eighty-two is not very long compared to eternity. If you're an old person like me, hey, you're in your 60s, hey, two-thirds of your life is already over. You need to make a major decision now. If you're a young person like these people right here, psh, I was young then. I was standing there watching some red-headed woman up on the stage. I thought I had all the answers. I was 19 years old. I thought I was going to live forever. I had no idea that day the idiot in that room was me. I'd have given anything. As Grandpa used to say, too soon old, too late smart. <laughs> I'd have given anything to know then what I know now. I'd have lived a completely different life. I'm, I'm serious. You wouldn't even recognize me now. I wouldn't be standing here. What kind of thinking pattern do you have? Are you good ground like Nathaniel? Do you overanalyze every little thing and nitpick it apart? Criticizing yourself and others? Plucking every feather off of it? Is that the kind of person you are? Are you burdened down with a huge IQ? Oh man, we'll pray for you tonight. Are you like Thomas? Something good happens to you. Click. It goes negative anyway. Do you need to be broken like him? You want the Lord to keep treating you like Philip? Having people come up to you and asking you questions. Constantly asking you questions. Well, if you do that, what's going to happen to you? Well, if you, if you go there, how will that affect here? Really? You want people to ask you questions the rest of your, your life, trying to get you to think spiritually? I, I don't think so. You have a free will. That's the most important thing to God. That special gift of a free will, he only gave 
to humans and angels Nobody else got one fish don't have it Plants don't have it Pets don't have it Have you thought about how you think? A couple of years ago, I'll close with this then. A couple of years ago, a woman came to me for counseling and she had had a horrible life. It was really bad, lots of abuse and everything. She had gotten saved and filled with the spirit as a teenager. Then she backslid. Then she came back to God. Then she backslid. Then she came back to God. Then she backslid again. She's sitting in my office. And she tells me all those horrible things that happened to her in her past. And she went over her current problems, clinical depression. Loneliness, fears. I said to her, you know something? It just dawned on me. I think I know what the major problem is here. I said, the devil has convinced you that all these things you just told me are very important things and they matter a lot and they require a lot of your time energy effort and emotion to think about them and process them because they're very important I said I don't know if you realize this or not but when you become a born-again Christian Old things pass away and all things become new. I said, your parents abused you when you were young. I get that. And that was horrible. But you traded your parents in for your heavenly father. He wouldn't abuse you in a million years. He wouldn't hurt you under any circumstances. But the devil keeps telling you that all these horrible things that happened to you in the past, this is important information. And you need to dwell on this and spend a lot of hours per day focusing on all the crap you went through. In fact, if the devil had his way with it, you'd start focusing on it when you first wake up and focus on it as you try to go to sleep at night and can't. She said to me, I'm already doing that. I said, I know that was a rhetorical statement. The devil tricked you into thinking all that stuff matters, and he knows it doesn't. He tricked you to default. You've got a default mechanism in your mind, you rehash everything. My sister came out and visited me a few weeks ago. I love my sister. By the time she left, I had strange pains in my body. <laughs> I had aches here. I had some aches down in here. Weird. I sat down and I started thinking about it. And I realized that we had discussed 15 or 20 different things that had happened to us when we were kids with my drunken parents. 
and she had rehashed it. And she said, this happened, and yeah, I remember that, and this happened, and I would chip in. The devil sucked me into it. He beat me. He outsmarted me. She would say, well, you remember when this happened? And I said, no, that's not exactly how. What happened was I came home, and I was adding to the story, clarifying the insanity. <laughs> Stupid. Stupid. I, I got sucked right into it. I wasn't even thinking. I mean, the devil just... He's so subtle. And we had gone over 15 or 20 different, she had brought them up. She'd bring them up. This happened and that happened. See, if you have a default mechanism in your mind that's negative, you'll do what we did when my mother confronted us when we were young. She says to me, I'll never forget it in the living room. She says, do you, do you and your sister ever remember any of the good times? <laughs> That's what she said. Don't you see how the devil works? With that default mechanism in your mind toward negativity, you can't remember the trip to Disneyland or winning the cake or whatever. It's always the bad stuff the kids remember. And that's the stuff they always bring up. It's the negativity. But what are they really telling you? They have a default mechanism in their mind. They have not been renewed. They naturally, by nature, click to something bad. We did that. Second time she said that to me, I got mad at my mother. I said, well, what happened was good. I got her. She was stumbling there. She couldn't remember any either. But there was a lot of good times. But you see, if you have a mindset that defaults to negativity, the good stuff fades, the negative stuff rises to prominence and stays at the forefront of your memory. All these things my sister brought up while she was here that made me sick. I had never thought about them until she brought them up. I had cut them. I said, hey, the, the devil tricked me. He said, this stuff's important. Well, it wasn't important to me anymore because I was a new creation of Christ. My sister is still important to her. He's tricking her. Don't you see that? Her mind's not renewed. She has the original default mechanism toward negativity. From what went happened to us as we were kids. All right. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Father, uh, I took some some of these disciples in your word tonight and I kind of psychoanalyzed them. And if I missed anything I apologize for that but there are some people here tonight and they're good people they've got good hearts and they love you and they care about you but they have a default mechanism in their mind that they have not renewed their mind and this default mechanism I did my best to try to get them to see how they think but I cannot heal anyone's mind and I cannot help anyone I don't have those skills only you can only you can help them I never understood what she meant when she said it at the time but I do now I don't have a thing she said I'll never forget it as long as I live, Lord. The devil has tricked some of my friends here tonight. He told them all these negative things matter. They're important. They do not matter, Lord. The only thing that matters is their future with you. The only thing that matters is them renewing their minds, 
and finding their destiny in Christ. That's all that matters. What happened to us when we were kids in our dysfunctional families? Many had worse families than mine, much worse. No longer matters. The devil wants me to think about it all the time. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to repent of it. I'm not going to think about it all the time. There's some people here tonight that need help. And the Holy Spirit is the only person who can help them. No one else can. I don't need a bunch of angels here tonight. I need the Holy Ghost. I have God's Word. That's all I need. And I pray for each person here who's like Philip, who thinks too much. I pray you will forgive them. I pray you will heal them. I pray for each person here tonight, like Doubting Thomas, poor guy. He'd had so many disappointments in life. All he thought about was another disappointment. He isolated himself. He withdrew from people. He withdrew from you. He was disappointed in you. I'm ashamed to admit it myself. I've been disappointed in you, Lord, because I didn't understand. I was ignorant. And I'm sorry for that. And I apologize for it. I don't want to ever be disappointed in you again. I'm praying you will heal them. Every person here tonight, like Thomas, Philip. Because there's several people here tonight who are like Nathaniel. They're good ground. They just need to remove a couple things from their life. And they'll grow. And they'll bloom. I pray you will reveal it to them. The Bible says to take up our cross and follow you daily. Take up in Greek means to pick up and get rid of. And I pray right now that each person will look at how they think and look at what the devil is telling them that's important. Yes. And I pray you will give them the faith to cast this out of them for the rest of their lives so they can fulfill their destiny and their call. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. We'll take a five-minute break, and we'll be right back here to pray for you. What? A, that's wicked. That's wicked. Hurting people and then laughing it off. God, have mercy on my soul. Get out of my body right now. Hurry up. Get out of there. Come out right now, quickly. I am not sick in the head. My subconscious is fine. I command you to come out of my mind right now. Negative thoughts and lies. Come on, just repent of it. Come on, Forgive just repent me, of it. Lord. Repent. Me, Lord. For, repent of your fears. Me, Go on. And a girl. Control. Forgive me. Forgive What's going on? I do have negative default. And I have memory gaps that are Yeah, missing. they're stealing your mind. And I want that back. I want to get over they're the They're stealing girl. your mind. Because it takes like... Study and won't save it. You had a negative default. A negative default in your mind ruins everything. It steals all your benefits. It robs you of the scriptures. It robs you of your future. Come on. Just repent of it. I command this negative thought process to come out of my mind right now. I repent of these fears right now in the name of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with my subconscious. Come out of there. Stop lying to me. Come on. You got to get mad. You got to get mad at these things. Let's go. What you need, hon? What you need, sweetie? Everything that you said today, it just, I felt that's what's going on with me. Right. And then I, I also, I have a hard time coming up here. And it's like a lot of no. fear and a lot of... Yeah, that's not our problem. Now listen, let's go back when you were young. Who got to you? Who hurt you? I guess my parents. What they do to you? Especially my dad. He would, uh, he would a lot of times tell me. Now, he would say that, you know, I have five brothers, and they're all my stepbrothers. And he would always say, oh, these are Marie's. I mean, these are my kids. 
but this one is as far as Marie's. You daughter. felt rejected. Excuse me? You felt rejected by your dad. Yeah. He preferred the boys over you. Right. And he still Correct. Does. And, he still does. and he still does. And I know. He better. wanted boys. He didn't want girls. Yeah, and I know better. And, and that's the thing. I What's your dad's name? Mike. Mike. Okay. You already forgave him, right? Atta girl. Raise your hands. Now, forgiving your dad is not good enough. It's not good enough. Your dad's rejection demon is still in here, causing low self-esteem and a low self-concept. And this rejection spirit from your dad causes you to overeat and use food as a comfort. Instead of the Holy Ghost, you use food as a comfort. And the demons are telling you to do it because they want you to get high blood pressure, diabetes, and die of a heart attack. What's your dad's name again? Michael, in the name of Jesus, you are come out of your daughter right now. Open your mouth. Come out of there. Come out, Michael. Let your daughter go. Come out of there right now. Go. Michael. Michael. Let your daughter go. Let her go right now. All the negativity, all the words you spoke against her, preferring her brothers over her. We release you and we forgive you in the name of Jesus. I let my dad go right now. I let my dad go. I let his rejection spirit go from me. Leave me now. Take a breath and blow. Leave me now. Leave me now. Come out. Blow. Unclean spirit of food. I bind your power. Come out of me right now. Right this second. Come out. Come out right now. What you need, honey? What's wrong with you? I don't know. Um, all I know is um, I just need Jesus. I have a broken heart. From and I don't know. I don't know what else. Who broke it? Uh, people, but mostly uh, my boyfriend. He came here two months ago, and now he's gone. <laughs> and he's just broken up with the yeah. And when you were young, did somebody also reject you? Yeah. Who? This has kind of been throughout my life. Your whole life's been like that? Starting with? I guess when I was young and then with siblings and never, I don't know, always kind of odd one out, but I don't know, I guess I just have a problem with being rejected and I, I have such a tender heart, so I always see the good of people. Yeah, you're, and you're a good person, you want to help people. Raise your hands. Father God, you see this beautiful girl standing right here? The devil is tricking her. He gets her involved with people that she wants to help and wants to love, and then he pulls the rug out from under her, and they always disappear on her. And the devil put a fear spirit right in there. And today she's going to repent of putting others ahead of you. And the person she's going to please the most from this day forward is her Heavenly Father. Not men. The devil's tricking her to using men to fill this emptiness in her soul. And she's going to repent right now. Go ahead. Dear Jesus, I'm so sorry. There you go. Good. I'm so sorry, Lord. I want these men out of my body. All these men. Get out of my body. Go. This fear spirit hiding in my guts. Fear of another broken relationship. Fear of my future. Fear of dying alone. Fear of never finding love. Come out of me right now. There it is. Come out. Let your tears go. Come on. Come out. Come out. There it goes. That's it right there. Spirit of fear. Come out. Come out right now. Come out of her. Come out. Come out. Every ugly man that ever touched your body, fornication, adultery, fake love, leave me now. Leave me now. Come out right now. Leave me now. Leave me now. Come out of me. I repent of putting men ahead of the Lord. I repent of looking for men for comfort. I repent of looking for others for comfort. I repent of it. 
I'm releasing it right now. Come out. Right now. Come out. Come out, Spirit. Come out right now. Go. Come out. Come out right now. How you doing? What do you need? Yeah. Now, uh, now, before you were 14. I'm 37. I'm, you know, I've been drinking since I was 14. Now, before you were 14, did something bad happen to you? Yeah, a lot of things. What was it? A lot of violence in the home. From your dad? Who molested you? The babysitter. And how old were you? I don't even remember. I don't know. Grade school? My parents didn't know until, until I turned 30 and I found a woman. But it was a, it was a woman. It was a woman babysitter? Yeah. Fondled you? Okay. And then who beat you? Who was beating you when you were kids? I never got beat, but I got verbally yelled at. And I seen oh, verbally abused? I seen my dad do a lot of violent things. Was your dad an alcoholic? Yeah. Okay. My, and my grandmother as well. Okay. My okay. brother too, but I've been the longest one with the curse. Like, yeah. That it has, it has not left. Hasn't, yeah. I quit many times. I've, like I yeah. said, I've gotten failed multiple times. Yeah, I know. Luckily, no. nothing long. This last time was the longest time ever. Now, hey, I want to say something to you. The alcohol is not your problem. That's it. That's it. It's your broken heart. Raise your hands. Close your eyes. Watch this. Holy Spirit, you see this man that came from California? I know you love him. I know you were there when she molested him. I know you were there. You saw her touch him. You saw that unclean spirit enter his body and then later drive him to alcoholism. The same demon his dad had got into the sun. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we're going to completely forgive that babysitter right this second. Wherever you are, sweet Holy Spirit, I want you to hunt her down. I want you to find her. Put your hands on her and tell her she doesn't ever have to hurt anybody ever again. I want you to tell her, Lord, that we are forgiving her tonight. And that unclean spirit that got in his body that led to the alcohol and the porn and the low self-esteem, watching his dad drink, curse, swear, watching and listening to them verbally abusing him, that was all demons. And tonight, they're coming out of this man of God in the name of Jesus. I command you unclean spirit from my dad to come out of my body right now. Take a breath and blow. Good blow. Come out of me. Dad, come out of there. Keep blowing. Babysitter, you pervert. Come out right now. Come out of there. Come out. Come out. Come out right now. Come out, you pervert. Keep blowing. Come out of there. Come out of there, you drunk. He is not a drunk, and you know that's not the problem, you stinking spirit. Come out of there right now. You told that girl to molest him. You told her to do it. We forgive her. Now, spirit, come out. I command this demon of alcoholism from my dad to leave my body right now. Come out of me right now, I said. Come out of me right now, I said. Come out of me right now, I said. Come out now. Come out. Spirit of rejection, I command you to come out of me right now. Leave my body right now. Take a breath and blow. Leave now. Go now. Come on. Leave my body right now. I want my dad's demons out of my body. I want this childhood disappointment out of my soul. I want you to give me my tears back, Lord. Please help me. Please help me, Lord. I need my tears back. 
I am not an alcoholic. I am not a drunk. That's a lie from the devil. It's my dad's demons. I forgive my dad. I forgive that babysitter. And I want these spirits out now. I want these spirits out now. I want these spirits out now. Spirit of fear, come out of me now. Come out of there, you stinking pervert. Right now. Come out of my body now. Right this second. Come out now. Come out right now. Right now. Come out now. Right now. What you need, hon? What's going on? Four months and just got hit hard from every week. We got teeth hurting. And um, you got what? Teeth. Teeth. Our teeth's been hurting. We just want to make sure everything's out. It's insanely painful. So, I know we should be together, and I think Satan wants us not to be together, so we've just been, we've just been hit. What's the problem with him? What's the problem with him? Mm -hmm. Why are you here? What's the problem? No, we just uh, we just tell the Lord you're sorry. We don't really uh, have a problem. We healing. Just, well, healing. You don't yeah. have a healing Jeez. from what? Our teeth has been hurting. <laughs> that just started hurting when? When? Uh, we got married in April. April 13th. And when did your teeth start hurting? About a month ago. Yeah. About a month ago? Yeah. What's the root of your teeth hurting? That's what we'd like to know. Well, it's some spiritual root, isn't it? We think. Was there witchcraft in your family tree? No. Just tell the Lord you're sorry. How about yours? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Love you. What are you thinking about right now? What are you thinking about right now? Listen, the devil tricked you into thinking alcohol was the problem. It's not the problem. It's this wound on your soul. That's why you're crying right now. Now, just raise your hand and let the Holy Ghost remove that wound. Are you ready? Just let him give it to him. There it is right there. Just give it to him. There it is. It's, it'll come out right now if you'll just do that. He'll take it if you'll give it to him. He won't take it if you won't give it to him. You got to forgive yourself. Just forgive yourself. You get healed right now. What's the root of it? The root of it. Think about it. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. Come on, just just forgive yourself. Let your tears go. You're holding back. Now stop holding back. Come on. Come on now. Thank you, Jesus. Your Heavenly Father would never yell and scream like your dad did. Your dad is not around anymore. Your Heavenly Father is here. He would never hurt you in a million years. Come on. I'm so sorry, Lord Jesus. I hurt myself. What's what's the root of it? We're asking the Lord. I don't know. Yeah. The Lord, just tell her what it is. Spiritual. God, forgive me. Say that. Now, you just do what I tell you. I'm the expert here, not you. Ready? You're a very loved person. Just follow my lead. Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry I hurt myself. I'm sorry I hurt my family. I'm sorry I've been carrying around these wounds from my dad all these years. I want you to take them from me tonight. I'm going to give them to you right now. Go. Take a breath and blow. Like that. Wound come out. Wound come out. Wound come out. Drunk, drunken spirit come out. Rejection from my dad come out. Self hatred come out. Come out. Come out of my stomach right now. Come out. Come on now, come out. I'm going to release every man that ever touched my body, every ugly man that touched my body, that had demons, every de man that had demons I slept with, I want them all out tonight. Come out now. Right now. Come out now. Come out of me now. Say it. Come out of me now. Come on. Come out of me now. What is it? Fear. What? Fear of what? Uh, 
Wow. We have a call on our lives. We're in ministry, so now Well, your, your first call is not in ministry. It's it's for you to get healed and cleaned out. Yes. Where are you going? Where are you going? Hey, what you need? Ben? Ben, what do you need from the Lord? I got, like, I have, like, fearful thoughts and a lot of self-hatred. And, and when did it start? After I came back to my rack. Uh, in 2003, cousin. this is my cousin. What happened in 03? Uh, I came back to my rack uh, the first time, and I just <laughs> had a lot of negative thoughts about life. Okay. Okay. Raise your hands. Spirit, you got into his brain in 2003. We bind your power. You're trying to steal his future and his destiny. He's been called by God and you're blocking it. Let your tears go. And in the name of Jesus, open your mouth. In the name of Jesus, you seducing spirit in his brain. You get out of there. You stop stealing his future. You stop stealing his thoughts. You stop stealing his mind. Now come out now. Come out now. Come out right now. Father, forgive me for thinking all these negative thoughts and believing them. Forgive me for speaking negative things. Forgive me for speaking negative things. Forgive me, dear God, for that. I repent of it and I command this spirit to come out of my brain right this second. Come out. Lord. Come on. Let's go. Get out of my head. Get out of my head. Come out. Get out of my head. Come out of my body. Lust and porn. Come out of there. Right now. Come out right now. Come out right now. Come on, sweetheart. You're going to have to pray harder. You cannot leave here sick tonight. I pray harder. Come out. Satan, I command you to come out of my head right now. There you go. Say that louder. Come out of my head right now. Come out of my head. There he comes. Keep coughing. They're coming out now. Come out. Come out right now. Come out right now. Thank you. Come out of my now. Hold that. Hold that. Come out right now. Go. Come out. There he is. Keep coughing. Come out right now. Come out. There it comes. Poison. Come out. There it comes. Go now. Go now. Come on. Just repent of it. Pray harder. Come out right now. Come out in Jesus' mighty name. Get out of my stomach right now, you pervert. Get out of my mind right now. Come out right now. Come out right now. Every ugly man that ever touched my body, I command them to come out right now in the name of Jesus. Say that. Get out of my body right the second. Come out right now. Go. Come out of there. Come out of my stomach. Get out of my heart. Stop lying to me. Come out of my brain. Come out. Right now. Come out right now. Come out right now. I want my dad out of my brain right now. I want his yelling and screaming and cursing out of my mind right this second. Come out in Jesus' holy name. Come out right now. Go now. Come out right now. Come out right now. There he comes. Keep coughing. Go. There he comes. Keep coughing. Come out. There he is right there. Here he comes. Here he comes. There he comes. Terror and fear. Go. Self-hatred. Go. Violence and hatred. Come out. Come out. Come out. Fear. Go. Fear of my future. Come out right now. Fear of dying, going to hell. Come out right now. Go. Come out. Go. There he comes. Come out. Come out. There he comes. Go. Next one. Come out. Come out. Come out. Just pray harder. Just, just take my advice, okay? What do you got to lose? You came here from California. You got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose at all. What do you got to lose? Not a darn thing. Pray like he is. Pray like your cousin. In the name of Jesus, I command the devil to loose me right now. I command you to loose me right now, Satan. I command my dad's rejection to come out of me. I command my father's 
violence to come out of me. I command my parents arguing and fighting to come out of me. Come out. Lust and porn, go. <laughs> go. Go. Lust and porn, go. Go. Satan, get out of my body right now. Come out in Jesus' mighty name. Right now. Spirit of alcoholism, I bind your power in the name of Jesus. Come out of me. Come out of me. Negativity. Come out. There it comes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What you need, honey? What you need? Laura. Laura. I was here once before, but not here. It was oh. in the other place. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Come out right now. Uh, I can't seem to read the Bible. I, I have read Come out. The, I've read sung the Bible thirty-four times since nineteen eighty, cover mm. to cover. I cannot seem to make myself pick it up. Mm. Even though I'm already halfway through it. Mm. When did that start? It's very upset, huh? When did that start? Come out. Um, well, I, I made a resolution that I was going to finally read my Bible uh, day after day after day. No and when did all these problems and start? And then it got worse. When did these problems start? Come out. Uh, I believe my How husband old were was you? verbal. Um, okay, I was molested when I was 12 or 13. Who did my it? My dad, my Uncle Frank. I do not remember Uncle my Uncle Frank, but I Frank? remember one by my dad. Uh, I was. I also How had an abortion you? 42, 12 or 13. I had an abortion What's 42 your dad's years name? ago. I've gone through a retreat for it. My dad's name What's is your, Daniel. That won't work. Uh, your dad's name, Daniel? Okay, Where, what's this for? What's this for? Yeah. Where you get uh, that at? God told me to take it off the wall and put it around my neck and wear it every day. Where'd you get? What's that for? The same reason. He told you to wear that. Where's this? Uh, well, this I don't know about. I just, you don't know I just what that like is because it it's pretty. What's it's that? It's pretty. This I was given in Tombstone, Arizona. I walked into what a for? shop and a girl said uh, something, something, something. You better you watch for me in here. She said, yeah. you better watch coming no. in here. And I said, don't worry, I'm armed. And she your, laughed, and the guy gave me this. It your, says pray. It says pray. In your, fam in your family tree, is there witchcraft? Oh, definitely. My dad and mom raised us in a house where they didn't know. They were Catholics. They didn't know that it was witchcraft <laughs> from the people. Come out. It came, came gradually. Come out. Now, gradually, uh, uh, children pieced it together. Now, when these does, people were when, witches? When did the anxiety start? Uh, I don't know. I, I, oh, Jesus. When did the anxiety start? Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. I've always been afraid. I've yeah. always been afraid. Listen, ma'am, this, this situation here, is, to me, looks like it started before you were born. Okay? There's some kind of a familiar spirit here. It looks like Catholicism or something. Religious demons. Right. And then, the, and then somebody molested you when you were young, correct? Right. And you can't remember it? But you do remember, remember your dad, from my dad when you were about 14. Uncle Frank, but I believe. I, I know. This guy was my Uncle Frank was a serial woman. Frank was. What's your dad's name? My dad's name is Daniel. Yeah, you're praying beautiful. Tell him you're sorry. Now, listen, the problem is that this thing with you goes way back. Way back. Okay? And my great aunts were all over 200 pounds. Uh, the fat comes from the molestation. I can't stand the idea of being skinny even though I'm at death's door from it. They Your death's door they right now? I can't control my blood sugar. And oh, I'm blood sugar. six meds and I'm scared to pieces of those meds. Yeah. They're hurting my stomach. Yeah. But she's trying to lower my blood sugar. She's trying to lower my blood pressure, my cholesterol. <laughs> and I'm scared to be stick slender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a phobia. Come out of there. Come on. See how he's praying? Pray like him. Okay, now just, can, can you relax at all? Can you relax? No. Okay, close your eyes and just take a big breath and relax. Here, put your arms down like I am. Just relax, okay? 
Just relax for but a you second. Get if you don't touch my arms. What's wrong with your arms? I, I, it, because you get too close to my chest. What's wrong with your chest? With your hands. What's wrong with your chest? You got pain uh, in your chest or something? No, I have no pain in my chest. What's wrong with your chest? But I don't want to get accidentally on purpose groped by somebody, even though you're. Oh, uh, grope. Okay, I know. That's, that's I, a demon of fear, and that's not our problem. So let's go back into, there he is, there he comes, keep coughing, come out spirit, come out, there he is, come out, keep coughing, come out of her, come out right now, come out of her, you're going to just do exactly what I tell you, come out of her, right now, keep coughing, come out, right now, familiar spirits, religious demons, witchcraft from her parents, come out right now, there they come, come out right now, come out of her stomach, come out, come out right now. Phobia of being skinny. Come out right now. Come out. You're Chopin of it. Come out. Fear of being groped. Fear of men. Come out. Fear of men. Come out. Come out of there. Get out of my body. Tell him to come out. Amen. You have the anointing right now. The weaker demons are starting to come out. Now let's go back to your childhood and get this sexual perversion spirit out of there from your dad. Okay, Come on. could you reassure me that you're not going to touch me? Because okay, no. it's bothering me. It's I know bothering it's bothering you. That, that it's That's a spirit doing that. I know, but you were touching my arms and, and it's okay. okay. I'm not touching you now. Thank That's you. a spirit thank doing you. that. Thank you. Okay, there's no reason to thank me. That's a demon telling you to thank me. He's giving you the fear. I'm not touching I, you right now. He's giving you fear. That. I understand that. Okay? I understand that. If you that. keep agreeing with the demon, then you can't get delivered. You have to come out of agreement with the devil. Okay? I'll show you how to do it. Okay. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, spirit of fear of being touched, fear of men, fear of being groped, fear of being molested. That is a phobia and a lie, and I command that fear to come out of me. Whatsoever is I, not of faith. I understand faith. what you're saying, but as no, a I'm not female, saying that. I'm praying. I understand that, but just a, two weeks ago, a no. guy just went and put his hand flat on this cross. I said, "Don't, don't touch my chest." You, you okay. don't understand. You're 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 explaining to me what your demons are doing to you. Not my demons. Yeah, I'm about you're, men. no, men. it's not men's. Not your problem. Men isn't your problem. This started before you were born. I, this okay. is a fear I spirit. I okay, that. and wearing that and this and that will do you absolutely no good. Um, okay. It won't do you any good whatsoever. You can wear 50 pieces of jewelry like a rap artist, and it won't do you any good at all. It's all a delusion. And I can prove it to you. You're standing here asking God to heal you. Yes. And you've been wearing this stuff for years. If that did any good for anybody, you wouldn't be standing here. Okay, this is a testimony. Okay, okay, I'm not going to tell you why I do, why I wear these. Okay. No, ma'am, you didn't hear anything I said. I saying you're wearing those. That's fine, but they won't do you any good. They're useless. Okay? I, I understand. Faith is the only thing that brings healing and deliverance. Wearing trinkets, pictures of Jesus, Pope hats, robes means absolutely nothing. It will not help you. If it did help you, you wouldn't be standing here asking for prayer. <coughs> Correct. Uh, <laughs> if this is going to help you, why don't you go get five of them and put it on? What do you need to come here for? How about ten? Go get ten. Your problem started in the womb. Yes, yes, yes. This is a spiritual. I, I you're not listening. This is a spiritual issue. Yes. Right? Yes. You have phobias about people touching you, being groped, being thin. You said a minute ago you have a phobia about being thin. Yeah. Remember that? You just told me that. Yes. That is a, de a demon in your brain telling you to be skinny is bad. He's tricking you. I just spent an hour and a half going over your mind here tonight. 
I totally believe it's a lie. Since you don't, I you, totally I, believe it's a lie. Now, since you can't heal yourself and you don't know what you're doing, a smart move might be follow Brother Mike's prayer. Since I don't know what I'm doing and I can't pray and get healed, why not give Brother Mike a shot at it? What do I got to lose? See what I'm doing? I'm treating you like Philip. I'm trying to appeal to your mind. Father, in the name of Jesus, please forgive me for not trusting you to take care of me. For having fears. Because fear means I have no faith. Fear and faith cannot coexist. I have fear. That means I have no faith. And I'm going to repent of it right now in the name of Jesus. I'm going to repent of it right now in Jesus' name. Notice how that demon told you to look back there. You didn't see that? You just turned around and looked back there. That was a fear demon told you to do that. I always have to look behind Ah, I. That's incorrect. You missed it again. It's not you doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's him doing it. Where's he at? Let me think about it for a second. Hmm. He's right in there. And he doesn't care anything about that thing. Does he? Really? If he cared about that thing, why don't you go get five more of them and put on? Oh, why don't you take no. one to your head? I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm telling you your problems are spiritual and they cannot right. be handled carnally. Right, right, right. You must right. confront him. <laughs> Come on, pray harder. Come on, sweetheart. How about this prayer? I'll pretend I'm you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I have phobias and fears. I got them as a child. It's because I have no faith. I wear trinkets trying to make up for my lack of faith, and it doesn't do me any good. The fear demon is still in my head. He seems to like my trinkets. So tonight, I'm going to repent of not having faith and not trusting you. I'm going to face this tonight. I want these spirits, my mother and dad and my family tree, out in the name of Jesus. I'm going to face my lack of faith now. Come on, sweetie. Just let it go now. Evil spirit of fear, you come out of her right now. There he is. Here he comes. Come out of there. Come out. Every other man that ever touched your body leaves tonight. Go. Come out. Right now. Right now. Come out. Come out of me. Rejection. Low self-esteem. Come out right now. Abandonment. Loneliness. Go. Go in Jesus' mighty name. You're taking control of your mind. Correct? Yes. Come on, what's wrong with you? I, nothing. I just, I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with you. A lot of things wrong. No, what I mean. What's, what's the main I, thing? I have a concern about about my um, heavenly language. I don't what know. What about it? I, I don't know. Go ahead. I'll tell you. Sometimes, sometimes it feels. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Okay, that's that's legitimate, but it's blocked. It's blocked. Okay. It's easy to fix. It's easy to fix. Okay. Let us pray after me. Boshaba. Kemosakia. Melo vashata. Melo vashata. Egoba. Bendosia. Did you notice how I was speaking in separate syllables? I, I have heard you. I have, I have tried it. Did you notice how I was speaking in short syllables? Yes. Right now, did you notice that? Did you notice that? Yes. Okay. Now let's now let's try it again. Like this time, you use your language and just use syllables. Use your language. Anything. Go. Good. Right there. 
Good, switch syllables, just like that. Switch syllables, switch. Okay, you just had a negative thought in your head? You said you, said you can't do it. Did you hear that thought? I've been trying to please the Lord and all day long. I start, I stop, I start, I stop. Okay, hold on. You hear that lie that got into your head? The devil beat you. You said that you were trying to please the Lord. That's a lie. You, you can't please him. He's already pleased with you. You blamed yourself. Go ahead and repent. I repent of blaming myself because God was displeased with me because I wasn't speaking in tongues right. That is not true. That's not true. God is not displeased with you because you can't speak in tongues or you have blocked tongues. He's not displeased with you at all. He's not displeased with you even when you're drunk. He's not displeased with you even if you're drunk. Okay, being drunk doesn't wipe out God's love. There's no way it's that powerful. You not speaking in tongues right and criticizing yourself is not good enough to break God's love for you. No, no, I know that. I know that. I, I'm just. I'm Why did you say you were you were trying to please God? Why did you say that? No, no. What I mean, <laughs> what I mean, what I mean is. I was never rejected. I have always spoken in tongues, but all of a sudden it's like something's going on where I feel like, wait a minute, I have heard there is a... Um, oh, you had negative thoughts about it. Yes. Yeah, the devil tricked you. You put a negative thought in your head and you believed him. Well, I didn't believe him. I want to You do now. <laughs> okay. Because you're telling me about it. <laughs> you're telling me. I'm not putting the words in my mouth. You're telling me. You got tricked by the devil. He told you to take a negative thought in. You did. And you believed it. And instead of listening to God, you listened to the devil. <laughs> Go ahead and repent. No, nothing. What? Any repentance yet? You just uh, look back there. What were you looking for? Uh, Hi. What were you looking for? Repentance. What was I looking for? Yeah, did you repent? I left you up here and gave you time to repent. Did you? Uh, I was, I'm trying to think. Sometimes my memory gets really bad. Okay, now you said my. Did you hear about that? Memory. Did you hear what you just said? You said my memory, short term and long term, gets really bad. Did you hear what you just said? Yeah. That was a lie. There's nothing wrong with your memory at all. That's him. Okay. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. I, I believe well, that. then why did you say it the other? It's a okay. way I express it to people. Now, you expressing it wrong is a lie. Correct? Okay. If I express... The devil has messed with both my short-term and long-term memory for years. Okay. Correct. The Lord said he would heal it. Okay. Heal now... The Lord didn't tell you that. You don't need a healing. So he didn't say that. You need deliverance. A spirit is living in your head like a tenant living in an apartment complex who won't pay rent. You don't need to heal the tenant. You need to evict the tenant. You don't need a healing. There's nothing wrong with your mind. You're fine. You need to remove him. You can't remove him if you have fear. That's why I was trying to get you to repent of your fears. Because that means you have no faith. Fear and faith cannot coexist. You following any of this? Yeah. Of course you are. You're an intelligent person. Did you hear that thought you just had? That thought you just had. What was it? It was negative. Uh, what was that thought? <coughs> I said you're an intelligent person and right. you had a negative thought. What was it? I, I don't know. I don't know. What do you need? Oh, um, you were saying that. What were you thinking? Uh, God told me before that it was um, my tendency to think very, very bad memories. And it totally well, wipes out my short-term and long-term memories. Okay, that, that, none of that is true. That's a demon doing that. It came from your childhood. You've got witchcraft in your background. Catholicism, re religious demons, witchcraft. They take over a person's mind. 
That's that's what's wrong with you. That's what you have. It came from your childhood. I just well, want to thank you for your radio ministry. Oh. It's helped me. <laughs> oh, um, has? Okay, my good. Through my walk this past year. And so um, I just want to thank you for that. And <laughs> I do, the only thing I struggle with right now is just like a food addiction. And I don't know why, because like, I love God. And, no, I know you love yes. God. And you got a good heart on you, too. Yes. Right? Come yes. on up here. <clears throat> I want to be an event. And you're a nice yes. person. Yes. Yeah, and you care about people. Yes. Don't you? Yeah. And you like to be heal a healer. In fact, you like to be an inner healer, yes. don't don't you? Yes, you I like to evangelize and, and help. And, and see everybody get healed. Yes. Okay, now the first thing we got to focus on is that's not our problem. Okay. I know. And I the food uh, issue is a symptom of the problem. The real problem is buried in your soul. I know. And what's that problem? I don't know. I can't. I'm trying what happened when you were young? Something happened to you. Who hurt you? Um, I just, my my parents were divorced and I didn't divorce Divorced and you were how old? Oh, little. Very little. I mean like two or three or four or five? Yeah, three to four. Then they were divorced? Yeah. Did you know about it at that age? I feel like I, I, feel like I remember them fighting. And who did you stay with, mom or dad? But, uh, mostly mom. Mostly. You stayed with your mom? Yeah. Now was your mother a nagger or a nitpicker? She's a nagger. She. Was to you, I mean. Was she a nagger or a nitpicker when you were little? I don't She struggled with her own spirits, and I think it fell on me. And I what, what fell on you? Like her, like the family curse of being divorced, being unhappy, being fearful. Was your mother unhappy and a fearful yes. person? Yes. And was your mother a verbal person? Yes. Was she, when she got upset or afraid, afraid, did she talk more and yes. faster? And when you did something wrong, was she? Did she talk it out of you? Yes. Okay. Now, now we know what it is. Okay. Now you just close your eyes there. Close your eyes, and then you relax. See? The lights are down. No one can see you. Just take a big breath, right there. Big breath. All right. Father, you see this beautiful girl here? She got a golden heart on her, and she would like to minister to people and help them. But she can't. It's blocked like a cork in a bottle. And her mother is the cork. She pumped fear into her soul when she was little. First they divorced. Then her mother did not adjust to the divorce very well. She was hurt and wounded. And her verbal fear and anxiety poured into her heart there it is there the fear demon just jumped and she transferred the spirit of fear into the daughter okay. father I need you to reveal to her what's your name I need you to reveal to Vicki how serious this condition is and this fear spirit his long-term goal is diabetes, yes. high blood pressure, yes. and a heart attack. Yes. Yes, and he's going to kill her. And he got in because her mother kept running her mouth and caused her anxiety and fear when she was little. And now that fear and anxiety in her soul causes her to overeat. She uses food as a comfort instead of the Holy Ghost. She puts food above the Lord. And tonight she's going to repent, and when when she takes all this seriously, she will be healed. What you need? Cherie. Cherie. Oh, what do you need? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You sure? I need a lot of things. I know you do. Oh, see her not listening. Did you see her jump back here? You see her turn around? Yes. Did you just see her turn around? Yes. That's how come she's not going to get delivered. You see that? She's not focused. And on top of that, her uh, her care for other people is more than her care for herself. She cares about you more than she cares about herself. So she abandoned her own prayer and then went to you. And she doesn't she doesn't want to be healed. So no her. She doesn't want to be healed. And that's why you jumped around because you knew she didn't want to be healed. So the devil tricked you into losing your healing by using somebody else who doesn't want to be healed. 
He's smarter than we are. You see that dynamic? Now you both leave not healed. And he won again. YouTubers, are you listening to any of this? This is like a PhD in the spirit world here. Hey? Now, here's what the devil gives you when you're a kid. This nervous fear enters your soul from the probably from the mother or the divorce or something. And then the devil gives you a defense mechanism to handle it. One of them's eating, the other one is laughing it off. And so when stress comes into her life, she, her instinct is to eat and laugh it off. The devil's using that like a pot, a cover on a pot to keep her sick and dying. Why am I telling you this? Because God, the Bible says God's people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay. So what I need some from her is serious repentance. Serious repentance. And what I need from you is the knowledge to know you can be healed easily if you'll just come get it. What's going on? How you doing? I'm Philip, man. What's happening? I'm Philip. Like what you're teaching today. Oh, okay. Everything all right? What's, you need prayer for anything? Well, I mean, yeah, because like everything I read in the Bible, like I'm always like overanalyzing it. Oh, like Philip. Right, like Philip. I'm brand new. Uh, no, you're smart like Philip. Yeah. yeah. You use your mind and you think, think about that stuff. You study. Overthink it. Yeah. Don't operate on blind faith. Yeah. Way too much. What's your uh, spiritual goals? My spiritual goals? Yeah. Honestly? What are you after down the road? Uh, to help other people. Okay. Demons. I mean. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Why not? Now here's what we need. What's your name again? Brandon. Brandon. All right. Lord, I got your preacher standing right here. Brandon. And the devil's got him all balled up. He's boxed up. He thinks too much. There he is. Come out. He thinks too much. He overanalyzes everything. And he quenches his own anointing. And I'm praying right now, Lord, do you give him the gift of godly sorrow and a broken heart so he will release the anointing? I pray that you will crush this machismo, this self-sufficient intelligence. I'm smart and I'm self-sufficient. No, he is to receive the broken heart. Catherine, cool. There, here comes one. Keep yawning. There's one. Give him Catherine Kuhlman's broken heart. Lord Jesus, I don't have a thing tonight. I'm asking you to give him back his tears and godly sorrow and a broken heart and save him because his life and his ministry is being wasted. The devil's using his mind to steal his years. Now, Satan, loose your hold. Loose your hold right now. Loose a man of God right now. Break. Break. Lord, whatever you got to do, I want you to break this man. Is any of this helping you? Any what? what, what what's going on here? What I've been saying. Is anything helping you? Yeah. I think so. I think so. Okay. Makes total sense. Yeah, and that's the root of it. Because my dad's family had a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, and my his my grandma was a German speaker and she was very afraid. Were well, her very parents from Germany? My, no. My, Grandpa? My, my grandparents on both sides were German speakers in Iowa. and Were their they, parents from Germany? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they descendants from Germany? Okay, okay. Uh, some of them were. Some of them were, but she was a... 
Uh, my one was a Jewess from all sides of the way. She, she had to get away from the family, and she came over here. She had a huge Bible, and she read it, even though she was surrounded by Catholics. As it turns out, five years ago, I found out we were Jews. Both sides of the family raised Catholics, and they're Jews. We now, were Jews. Did your mother have emotional or mental problems? I don't think she did. I think my dad did. He was a World War II Marine Corps veteran. And he roared like a bull whenever he heard his babies and children cry. And he screamed bloody murder that we should shut the blanky blank up. Okay, so clear, clearly we see your family tree is loaded with demons. Yeah. Loaded. Yes. Yes. And just naturally they took you. Makes common perfect sense. They were afraid of being found out. They never spoke. Fear. Fear. But they raised themselves Catholic. And I, uh, the, somebody said, look at her last name. That's a So my grandparents died, not ever knowing or admitting it was that close. To not even Fear. Yeah. Yes. See it? Yes. They thought they were going to be Fear coming down through your family tree, manifesting in you. Chronic fear, anxiety, anxiety. Looking around, looking around. There you're standing here. Look over there. Don't touch me. Don't grope me. Coming down from the family tree, fear took your life. And you can't get rid of it? Why? You've got to get to the root of it. The, there's a root of why you don't have faith in God and why you're scared. Okay? Let's find that and we can win this. Find that root. It was before you were born. All right. Hey, did you ever do that homework I gave you? Yes. You did. Did it help at all? Yes. Get out of there. Now, are you learning to fight harder? <coughs> you are? Is your mind getting any better? Your mind is it getting any better. Come out. Huh? Okay. How's your worship going? Better? Okay. Now show me. Go. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. You get on me right now. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. It's not important. When you come back here next week, desperation. Okay? You can't make her want to get healed. Okay? Focus only on yourself. Release her to God. Release her. Okay? Get that fear thing out of there. It can't in there from your mother. Once that's gone, you'll be praying for the sick and they all get healed. What's your first name? Don't let her or anybody else block your future. Okay. We're talking to him. Okay. We're talking. No, you can't listen to him now. What do you say? They're cursing at you in my head. What are they saying? They're cursing at you in my head. Oh, that's a good sign. Yeah. What's his name doing that? Get out of there, you cursing me. Come out right now. The demon cursing at me. You come out of that mind right now. Come out of his head right now. Come out quicker. Hurry up. Get out of his head. Don't say no. Don't you say no. You come out head. Come out right now. Don't you curse at me again. Come out right now. Come out right now. Come out right now. Get out of that body. Hurry up. Stop cursing. Go. Go right now. Go right now. Come out. Thank you, Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Now say it like you mean it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Lord Jesus, I love you. Say it like that. I love you, Lord Jesus. I command this evil spirit from my mother and my dad and my grandparents. I bind that filth. I command this Catholic witchcraft monster to come out of me right now in the name of Jesus Christ. There he is. You see that? See that demon bark? Come out right now in the name of Jesus. Come out of there right now. Come out right now. There he is. Come out. There he is right there. Come out, you rotten devil. Witchcraft, come out. Loose your hold. 
There he is. Come out. See, man, I see him right there. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there right now. There he is. Come out of there, you witch. Witchcraft. Come out in Jesus' mighty name. Witchcraft. Mother Mary demons. Come out. Mother Mary, come out. Jewish Jewish demons, come out. Judaism demons, come out. Fear. Terror. Come out. Come out of there. Get out of her throat. Come out of her throat right now. Go. Go now. Down right now. Come out here. Come out of there. Come out right now. Come out right now. What, what you need, sweetheart? I just want God to deliver me from whatever's hindering me. And oh, what's hindering you? Oops, oops. I'm growing in the Lord. And what's hindering you, honey? What's bothering you? Something's bothering you. Tell me to pray for my marriage. What's this thing here? Where'd you get that thing? Um, one of the women in our church sells jewelry and we buy it. Is that Native American? No, it's gray. It's what? It's not turquoise. I don't know. No, take that off. <laughs> you got any other jewelry on? Where'd you get those at? It's a set. That's a set? Okay. What's this thing? My wedding band. What's that thing? Where'd you get that at? Pawn shop? Hey, can you take that? You mind taking that? You know her? You know this girl? Okay. What's what's wrong with her? What's wrong with her? Another one came out. Keep going. Come out of there. Come out right now. Lord, give him his tears back. Hey, what's wrong with her? She won't tell me. My marriage isn't right. No, I know that. But what's, what's wrong with her emotionally? That's Honey, what's hurting you in here? In here, what's hurting? You? Tell him, sister. Tell him everything. My marriage isn't right. I'm married to an unbeliever. Uh, now, why doesn't he like you? Why he, doesn't your? He's busy enjoying his worldly things and neglecting me. Why, why is he doing that? What is it about you he doesn't like? Did he think that yeah, he can do it on his own? I don't know. Live life on his own, not with you, you don't know why your husband doesn't like you? You don't know why? Because I'm, I'm a child of God. That's the only reason? You're a Christian and he doesn't like you for that? We've been together 21 years. And oh, 21 years? How old were you when you got married? Uh, just last October. They were living together and then she, she came back to the Lord and she, she didn't want to be sleeping with him until they got married. She said, I'm going to marry you. I have to marry you. So sleep, keep continuing to sleep with you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. But everything's the same. And it's just the same. Now, when you got, you say you got married a year ago? October. October. And then at the time you got married, was the marriage in good shape then or was this, was it shaky? We weren't married until last summer. I mean, the relationship. Was the relationship good then or was it bad? The same bad. It was, was it bad or good? I mean, he doesn't physically abuse me. No, I didn't ask you that. Well, I'm just trying to say whatever he isn't. I don't but it's not like the husband and the wife relationship, right? Because he does neglect you a lot. He what? He don't neglect her a lot. He doesn't feel loved. And was he like that before you married him? Well, we, we could at least watch TV together. I don't want to sit down and watch TV in the same room because... Now you can't watch TV together? I don't even know. Because I don't like to choose my spirit when he watches. Oh, you want you don't want to watch the trash anymore? Yeah. Oh, okay. Profanity and cussing and... Okay. So he's he's distancing himself from you. What's his name? Richard. Richard. Okay. Now, here here's what we got to do. We have to release Richard out of there and give him to the Lord. We have to let him go. Because the Lord won't break Richard if you're hooked into him. 
<laughs> Emotionally, because you would be hurt. Do you see what I mean? You follow me? She has to release Richard to the Lord. We have to give him to God tonight and let him go. Okay? So the Lord, the Lord will the Lord will move on him. But the Lord won't break him if you're gonna be hurt over it. Okay? So you you were living in adultery for years and then didn't get married until last October. Correct? Okay. What was his name again? Richard. Okay, ready? Raise your hands. Lord Jesus, I need to be forgiven tonight for making tragic mistakes with my life. Bad choices. I moved in with a man who had demons and I lived in sin for years with a man who does not love you. He is not born again. He does not have the Holy Ghost. And I thought in my mind because I thought I could fix it, that if I just married him, everything would get better. And the devil tricked me into thinking that would fix anything. In fact, it's made everything worse. And I'm so sorry for what I did and trying to fix this myself. The Bible told me to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not lean to my own understanding. And I did it. I leaned to my own understanding. I married a demon-infected man, and now I'm paying a terrible price for it. But I know that you love him and you can save him if I release him and let him go. And I want to release Richard out of my soul tonight and all the pain he's caused me and any spirits that transferred into my body, living in adultery for years and years, sleeping with a demon-infected man. I have to release Richard out of my soul tonight and give him to you. And I'm going to do that right now. Go ahead. Go on. Release Richard and let him go. How you doing, Mike? I don't I understand any of this. You don't understand any of this? Probably spirit in your head. What's the problem? What do you need? What's wrong with you? Why are you here? Because I've seen, I've read the word. I know it's true. I've seen, I've seen the verse. It does, but I can't. I can't feel it. I don't. You can't feel it. What do you mean? I'm trying, but everyone here, I can see it. their prayers it helps them. They feel better. Oh, I see. You're not reacting like everybody else is, and you're you're I, you're I thinking there's something wrong with you. Correct. I don't feel it. You think there's something wrong with you because you don't feel it? Correct. Sure. Yeah, I, got, I know what's wrong. Come on, just repent of it. I command Richard. I command Richard to leave my body right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. I take my body back and give it back to the Lord. My body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, not a load of adultery. My body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, not a bucket for demons. And I repent of living in sin for all these years and sleeping with a demon-infected, unsaved man. That was a sin in the eyes of God. I should never have done that. And I let some of his spirits transfer into me, and I want them out right now. Come on. Okay, listen, the devil's trick, tricking you. Is you. Are you smart? I'd like to think so. Yeah. Now, you're Philip. I taught about you tonight. Philip, see, he's a thinker. Okay? And... The demons are, are uh, it's easy for them to beat thinkers. It's easy, and here's why. They're smarter than you are. The person who has the higher IQ can beat the person with the lower IQ. It's very similar to Jeopardy. The, the guy that's smarter than the other guy gets more of the answers and makes more money. That's a show. Jeopardy is a show based on IQ, right? They, the smart guys win. The dumb ones lose. 
he's lying to you by telling you that because you don't feel anything there's something wrong with you or that's bad that's a trick he tricked you that's not what he tells me. He tells me What's he tell you? He tells me there's something wrong with you. He tells it was something wrong with me. He's everyone called everyone here. It's yeah. A, it's, it's a seed of doubt. It's in my mind. And it's, yeah. It's whispering all day long. Crazy. Oh, great. Crazy. Yeah. You know, they're crazy. Don't believe it. Right. You're on it. He's lying to you. It's not true. It's a big joke. He's using your mind against you. But just a few minutes ago, you told me that you weren't reacting like all these other people. You remember telling me that? Yeah. Why did you tell me that? Why was that a concern to you to tell me that? Oh, you had a thought that you weren't going to get in the kingdom of God because you weren't acting like these people? See, another trick. See that that's not true. <clears throat> hey, this guy standing right here is a textbook Philip. Textbook. And he has the exact same symptoms Philip has. See? He the he thinks so much, and the demons are smarter than him. So if somebody's smarter than you, they can control your mind. <laughs> and they keep pumping lies into his mind. They just float right in like they're nothing. <laughs> and he's so used to receiving them, they seem normal. <laughs> It seems like him. And it's just a big giant bucket of lies. When you pray to the Lord, he hears you, he hears you just as much as he does me, even if you don't feel anything. It's a prayer and he hears it, period. Prayer is you talking to God. Here's a prayer. Lord, I love you. Did you see that? I just prayed. I told him I loved him. Lord, please help my friend here. He's got brain demons. They're in his head. And I know you know they're in there. And I know you love him. And I know you're going to help him. Thank you. Did you see that prayer? That's a good one there. Yeah. I know how to pray. That's all it is. It's that simple. You just open your heart and speak sincerely. That's a prayer. Are you following me? Yeah. All right. Now, what you got to do is what sometimes preachers call it stepping out on faith. You ever heard of that? Okay. Philip's in the boat. Uh, Peter's in the boat. Jesus on walking on water. And Peter goes, Lord, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter, by faith, steps out of the boat onto the water. Notice that? If he just stayed and hit the boat and said, Okay, Lord, I want to come to you. I want to come. I want to do that. Now that guy leaving right there. See that guy right there? He is not, he, he needs to do exactly what I'm telling you. That guy right there. Sometimes you step out. Don't leave. I'm talking to you. Peter's in the boat. And Jesus standing on the water. <laughs> and Peter goes, Lord, I want to walk, come to you. Let me come to you. What's your name, ma'am? Are you with him? You know that guy? Well, oh, that's your son. Oh, can you stay here for a minute? Peter steps out on faith. See, he stepped out the boat on the water. Okay. And he starts walking. He's walking on the water. So is Jesus. Peter and Jesus are the same. They're both walking on the water. They're both walking because they both stepped out on their faith. Notice that? Peter then starts to look around and he sees the waves and the wind and he starts to lose his faith and he starts to sink. Can you hear me? I'm listening. Yeah. Ah, good. No, don't. I know you're in pain. That's all. That's not you. That's all demon pain. I'm trying to help you. <clears throat> he starts to sink like that guy. He's got a lot of pain in his body. He's sinking. He's sinking. Okay. Peter was sinking. 
Why? He started to lose his faith. Correct? Then he yells out for the Lord, save me. And Jesus shoop, reaches down and snatches him before he goes under. <coughs> Remember that story? You ever read that story? Okay. Now, now, just you watching me? Now, just by faith, you don't feel anything, nothing. Just do what I tell you. Okay? Stand right here. Do you speak in tongues? Okay, raise your hands, close your eyes, and just pray like this. Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for not letting me die and go to hell. I thank you for your mercy and your grace. I thank you for helping me, Lord. Thank you for your blessings, Lord. And by faith, I receive the Holy Ghost tonight. By faith, I receive the Holy Spirit, and I'm stepping out on my faith. I'm reaching out, Lord. By faith, I'm stepping out. Come on, keep going. Now you try it. Go ahead. Hey, Mom. Thank you. <clears throat> Hey, you're his mother? Yes. You're his mother? What's yes. the diagnosis? Um, well, fibromyalgia. Okay. Hey, did you have pain anywhere else in your body when you came here today? I commend every ligament, every bone. Right now? You didn't have any pain anywhere. Okay. So the only thing that's better is your lungs. Has God created her? Okay. I mean, it felt. Shoulders? Line up? No, sir. I still feel some What's that down there? Tightness where? Why are you grabbing your tummy? Okay, hold on a minute. Here, sweet Jesus. Heal. Lungs, I command you to let go. Let go and come out. Demons from India. Go. Right? Check it out now. Any change? Worse, better, same. Is this better or worse? Is this lung thing better or worse? If you ran again, could you tell? Any change in your fibro? Worse, better, or the same? Any change? Same. Okay. How about the hate? Up or down? Yeah, but I mean, do you have any hate for it? You know what hate is? Yeah. You despise? Have you ever hated anybody? Okay, good. Anything? Or is it the same or worse? It's not worse. Um, I still feel some tightness. Yeah. Usually if I try to run, it'll usually tighten up more. So it feels like it's more relaxed. It's more relaxed? Okay. Now when I prayed for you over here about the good Lord to show you this, if he does show you that he loves you, would you be willing to dump everything and just run to him if he shows you no is it I'll rephrase if the good Lord shows you the truth what I prayed over here if he shows you that's truth would you be willing to let everything go and run to him is that a deal and you if that happens you agree to let me know okay deal <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, by next Friday, that hate meter is going to be from here to here. Right? Against that person. It's a person. Correct? You're leaving town? You don't live here? Oh. Do you live in California with your mom? I've been there for a couple months. I've been living in Colorado mainly these last few years. I was going to go back to Colorado. Well, can't you stay here a little longer with your relatives? I can. Okay. I wanted to go to work out. I was hoping I'd get a chance to talk to you. Okay. Let's do that. You mentioned the healing house you're putting together. What's your phone number? What is her phone number? Because my cell phone's out. Give my cell phone number. What's your number? Yeah, I'll give you the house number. You can probably leave it. Okay. Come on in here then. <laughs> How you been? Very good. good to see you. <laughs> How you like the new place?